Uh, my name is James Nappi, I'm the MD of Vector UK. And firstly, thank you very much for taking the time, especially in the weather uh, today, coming down here. Uh, so it's it's really uh, good from, from our perspective to, and this is why we didn't run it on uh, a webinar session or, or even live on Teams, just want to have people in the room so that uh, we can get some of that uh, close discussion going because even though we are now a much bigger company than we were two years ago, <laughs> we've had, you know, Stephen is from uh, one of our acquired companies, uh, ACS, who's sitting in Northampton, um, uh, and we also bought a company, if you're not aware, uh, in London called Tangible Benefit. Um, so we're kind of 200 million plus pound organization now in the UK. But one of the things which I'm hugely keen to do, having been at Beckler and started Beckler in the UK back in 1997, um, really keen to make sure that we stick to our values. And the values that we have are, um, quite simply, high levels of customer services, high uh, of customer service, high levels of, of, it, of real interaction and a personalized service. So just because we're getting bigger, we take the good bits of that, buying power, all of the contacts, you know, you can't believe the amount of interest that you, we now get uh, in addition in the UK from all of the big vendors, you know, your Microsoft's, HPE's, HP, the Lobo, Cisco's, uh, you, you name them, they all want a, you know, a, a part of, of what we're doing. And um, so it's not, it's kind of leverage those bits, but then make sure that we stick uh, true to what our values are, which is looking after people well, getting in-depth in a uh, conversation, so not broad brushing uh, things, uh, and, and making sure that we just give everybody uh, the level of service which they need to satisfy their own internal organisations, because we all know how tough that can be, especially from IT, everyone wants to point a finger if something goes wrong or whatever. Um, but also to make sure that you can get the efficiencies and take the efficiencies back to the business to then in turn impress your customers, which is ultimately what it's all about, right? So um, we have, what we, have, we did actually today was we asked a lot of our people to see, because we had a, a three in two out uh, policy. So we said, if you can work from home today, because we want to make sure the car park's um, empty enough for people to come and park their cars. Um, but we have got a lot of our business solutions team upstairs uh, from our other technology pillars. So we have a fantastic team around uh, Microsoft and, and software. So Zoe uh, waving, heads that up. Um, and we've got um, other members who got uh, Sue, they believe, <coughs> mayors around as well within our software teams. So you've got a kind of 10 strong software team that can do anything around um, Microsoft 365, NCE, EAs, whatever you need. Um, but we also have our other technology pillars here, uh, you know, hybrid infrastructure, network and server storage, cloud, um, security, modern workplace. Uh, and I've probably missed one of two oh, I've got a services. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take your speech either. But yeah, I just, just want to kind of put, put that across. So if you in the breaks or whatever, if there's, if you get time or you get bored in here and you want to go chat to somebody else, just um, chat, chat to Maybelline and she'll arrange for you to chat to whoever might be interesting around other projects so um, but really exciting day today um, so just to start off i'm Nathan middleton um, i'm the microsoft and adobe vendor alliance manager here at backler and um, today joined by stephen um, so if you want to give a, a formal introduction to yourself stephen oh yes yeah, so i have um oh. <laughs> everybody smiles with it i'm a technology evangelist uh, which I think is what James calls you, you can't work out what I'm going to call you today. <laughs> um, but what that really means is, is understanding the technology, understanding the businesses and the clients. Um, and I, I'm sure it look amazing on that CV. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get over the cringe. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll be your Beckler hosts for today. If you do need anything during the day, just give us a shout or alternatively look for anyone <coughs> from Blue, Lanyard, um, this is Beckler, Beckler staff, and um, so just give someone a shout. And um, we are also joined today by our expert panel. Um, so Chris, Andy, if you'd like to Hi, introduce yourselves. <laughs> Chris Williams, um, I work alongside um, Becla and one of their partners, West Coast, Modern Work and Security. Um, a lot recently talking about Copilot, I think for the last six or seven months, anytime I talk to a customer, what they want to talk about is Copilot. Um, hopefully the journey we take you on today is talking about the the business challenges that will help to solve, what the technology looks like, a live demonstration, and then the session later around technology, the technology itself more technical, hopefully everybody gets something out of it. 
what I'm probably looking to get out of it today is really the questions you've got to ask, what you're thinking about utilising Copilot for within your businesses. So thank you everybody for attending. And then, yeah, I'm Mr. Walter, and uh, like Steve, I've got the uh, amazing title of strategist at Microsoft, and um, really that allows me to be in a position of learning the technologies and helping partners like that, like that on West Coast in the future, that we've got a complete plan as to how they're going to approach that, strategize with it, and then implement it either themselves or, or with their partners to make sure this is effective to your business plan as possible. Um, and I'll be here to answer all of the questions that uh, Chris pulls together from me. Finally, um, yes, yeah, so I'm the I sit uh, with uh, West Coast Cloud, so I'm a business development manager there. We work very close with Vector, so I have done for, for a lot of years now, um, helping them with modern workplace. And now, as Copilot, it's a new big, a new big thing. Looking after Copilot, making sure that not just our partners, but that our partners' customers understand the opportunity, how it should be implemented, and our security risk as well. So, yeah, and any questions? Great, thanks guys. Um, so we're going to kick things off today with an introduction to Beckler by Stephen and um, just a little bit of an overview of who we are, what we do and our global IT alliance. Um, then moving on to Copilot for your organisation and how you get started with Copilot um, and then we'll grab a little bit of lunch and then post lunch, um, as Chris has said, we'll see Copilot in action. Um, and then moving on to how Beckler can support you in your co-pilot journey, followed by the technical strategy that we're hoping you'll stick around for at the end, um, and then a Q&A in close. Um, so as I say, if you do need anything during the day, just give us a shout. Otherwise, I will hand over to Stephen. Thank you, mate. So um, how do you follow James's introduction to, to Beckler? Um, he's already touched upon the fact that we are a sizable organisation now, 15,000 plus employees across 14 countries across Europe, £7 billion uh, pounds worth of uh, a turnover, um, and you know, 1983, so is that 41 years young as well? So established player within the, within the IT industry. What that gives us is reach, so that European powerhouse, and as we have been using Copilot, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit about our experience of that as well today, um, we've been able to see how it actually interacts in different cultures as well, in different locations, in different countries, different languages. Beyond Europe, we have reach across the world with our global IT alliance as well. So we're able to deliver services and solutions for um, organizations across the world through those partnerships established businesses that share our values share our approach to delivering IT solutions and we are particularly lucky to have been uh, part of the Microsoft Jumpstart program so one of the few partners in the uh, UK um, that have had hands-on for the last two three months now of co-pilot Microsoft co-pilot uh, so uh, I've been lucky enough to have some some use of that to certainly help me day in day out um, and we can speak a little bit about that but not many I think there's a handful of us uh, have had the use and the experience and the exposure to actually what does it look like using it real world every day so when you're engaging with partners we're able to perhaps differentiate ourselves a little bit in ways because we can talk about what did it mean when I was creating my PowerPoint presentation or editing my emails or using Git within words, we'll see. And so, I said to James that we had a slide on it, <laughs> our pillars. So our business solutions and services team specialise across a broad set of pillars and technologies, and we see AI appearing in all of these. Um, Software, of course, is what brings us all to, together today. How do we license that? How do we get best value out of it? Are you utilizing that technology effectively, getting the most value? Network service and storage, delivering out those solutions that are in the data center, how we manage those, how this technology can potentially help us with that is certainly something that we've, we've got close eye on. The cloud, we have our, uh, let's go call it data stores, the old Beckler cloud uh, here in the UK, so we can offer custom private cloud hosting infrastructure as a service solutions. 
as well as Microsoft Azure major players in public cloud as well. We then have our cybersecurity and security co-pilot is one of the many co-pilots that's uh, being uh, spoken about at the moment. Certainly we're seeing how a whole wave of change driven by AI in that security space. It's enabling both our defences, but also then potentially some of those challenges uh, uh, those bad actors out there need to address as well. Document solutions, this is particularly, uh, I'm going to say exciting area. Document solutions doesn't normally fill me with huge joy. I'll be honest, we're going to talk about print uh, and paper. It's not the thing that get, get, not the traditionally gets IT excited, but the recent acquisition of a major stake in a company called Planet AI, specialising in the application of AI in those workflows and that's document control as well. So beyond delivering <laughs> fantastic core services that we all need and rely on, we have some expertise as to how that's changing as well with this new technology coming forward. And then of course, modern workplace. How does this technology affect how we go to work every single day? The Teams meetings we have, the interactions and the, and the environments that we have to have are in the rooms to get the right audio, visual, have the right meetings, deliver the uh, AI on the actual device as well. And underpinning all of that is our services. And we'll speak a little bit about how we can help you on your AI journey. Um, but we also have a strong services team within the UK delivering these solutions, helping people do proof of concepts, helping people implement, helping people deliver and support those day in, day out. And we even have uh, an AI project at the moment, which we're, we're deploying within our service teams to assist our first, second, third line desk when they're responding to clients, understanding the, uh, the flows, the calls, understanding documentation, and using AI to enable them to deliver better service as well. And we'll talk a little bit more in our follow-up event about that as well, about that project. But that's Vecla's core pillars, and that's us. I'm going to hand over now to somebody to get into the, the, uh, the real nub of it. So if I hang up to me, Chris, let you uh, speak about part of your organisation. So we've already done um, introductions, so we'll save that piece. The one thing that was actually touched on earlier on is a plethora of co-pilots. Um, co-pilot overload. I think the first question I ask when I speak to customers and they want to talk about co-pilot is which co-pilot, because there are so many. Um, really think about Copilot as the orchestration engine in the area of work that you're looking to work. So um, I get asked questions, can Copilot help me empower the eye? Yes, Copilot can help me empower the eye, but that's a specific Copilot empower platform. The Copilot we're going to talk about today is Copilot for Microsoft 365. So what does that look like? Um, so Copilot in the applications that you know and use every day. And we'll kind of go through that as we, we go through the session today, and you'll kind of see it in the applications later. I'll show you Copilot in Teams, in Outlook, in Word, in PowerPoint, et cetera. So we'll see a little bit more. Um, but before we talk through um, Copilot, the technology, um, et cetera, I think one of the first things to, to maybe ground ourselves on is what are some of the business challenges that um, customers face today? I kind of hope these challenges don't resonate with you because that's actually a good thing, but I don't doubt that actually is you describe some of the challenges you'll think you think yeah, literally this morning or yesterday or last week because I felt this my the employees in my organization talk about this all the time um, but before we talk about those challenges if you want to go and learn more about something that we do that captures these understandings it's called the work trend index the AK link is on the screen Microsoft we're a US based organization we are sometimes guilty of lending a US narrative to things that you might see from Microsoft um, the thing I particularly like about this study is you can see the span and the reach of where we are uh, obtaining information from customers. We don't also only look at the leaders within businesses, we also look at individuals that are contributing, so that individuals from the sales floor all the way up to the boardroom. But 31,000 people studied across 31 different countries to help us understand what are the challenges customers are facing. Um, I'm going to let Louis talk to you about some of our most recent studies. Yeah, so perfect. Thank you, Chris. Let's swap sides. Let me stand over this side and you can control that. Yeah. So when we look at that word trend index, what did it find? Now, has anyone heard the term digital debt? Hands in the air. Anyone come across it? Yes. Not you, James. So what I suppose, what did what is your understanding of it, Becky? Digital debt. Um, 
tech debt is like, oh my God, he's not hitting me up. I've heard of it. <laughs> but you can't, yeah. like thrown about and stuff. Yeah. It's like, not, well, not what it's yeah. doing. What about you, Richard? Do you... Well, it's just where you're using old stuff and it's like a hangover yeah. from previous technologies and you're not using the latest. So I suppose there's two, two different terms going on here. There is that technical debt and the digital debt, which is what the work trend index found. Let's take all of us here today. We're all missing out on emails, maybe Teams meetings, team messages. They're all going to back up. All by the time we get back to our work, whether it be three o'clock this afternoon or tomorrow morning, we're going to have how many emails in there? That's what digital debt is. Modern workers have got too many data points to process, too many emails coming in, too many team meetings, too many team messages, sometimes from the same person, because you're not replied in that same second. We're overburdened with these data points to process. That's bogging us down, so we're not able to do things that are being more productive, creative, and pushing our businesses forward. 64% of us struggle, say we struggle with that overburden, or within that study, say that we struggle with that overburden, inefficient teams messages, inefficient team meetings, overburden emails all blockers to our creativity and productivity. All of those emails, messages, all those data points coming in, you're not going to know the answer straight away. You're not going to be able to go and write off, you know, exactly what that, the, 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 the solution to that problem is or, or what you need to answer to that, to that question. You're going to have to find it in SharePoint, OneDrive, or on the internet, all time taken out of our productive time within our day, which is only limited. And then when we look at the other side of that, you know, what a business leader saying, they're saying that they're worried about a lack of innovation and breakthrough ideas within the business. But um, business leaders are also off the back of that, uh, two times more likely to use uh, to implement AI within their business, to boost the productivity of their, of their employees than they are to reduce the hate count. They want to use AI to make their employees more productive in Outlook. I know it's going to excel at uh, collaborative teams and creative and PowerPoint. They want them to, for their employees to do that so they can spend more time on the tasks that really matter to that business. So. That was that work trend index. We've had Copilot out for quite a while, you know, enterprise agreement customers that were over 300 users. They've had it since November the 1st. You know, we had the, the preview that, that Stephen mentioned. So we've had some feedback from those people that have got it. So what are they actually saying? What are they finding within that? Well, 70% of people said that it made them more productive. It was reducing that mundane burden, those admin tasks that they had to do that wasn't going towards the, their actual KPI or their actual work. Off the back of that, it actually, improve their quality of work so something that Stephen said 68 percent said it improved that quality of work not just making them more productive it's improving that end result improving that end quality of work and then you know this one's um a bit by the by but people that were given co-pilot what did they say after that you know if i could have co-pilot or take it away what would i want the majority of people said that they would actually have co-pilot or were not having it once they once it was implemented, once they had it, they didn't want to give it up because the change on their productivity and that end end for, uh, the output of quality of work was so drastically different they couldn't go back to it without it. So then when we look at that, you know, it's all well and good having these statistics and you know people want to use it, people, and it's making people people more productive. How do we know that people actually want to give work to an AI and, and give those tasks to an AI? Well, who's used ChatGPT? You know, let's go back to, to what it actually is. Who used ChatGPT and give it a work or a personal? Yeah, so quite a few. What do we find? Did we like it? Did, what what did you get it to do? Yeah? <coughs> Overall, very good. Well, we look at ChatGPT and, and we'll go into it in a little bit. That ChatGPT is cold pilot. That is that underlying large language model. We went in two months, we went from zero users to 100 million users. Now that could have been work, that could have been personal. But people are giving this work to an AI already. What we can do with Copilot is we control it and utilize it better in a safe environment. You know, it took 16 years for internet to mobile phones to reach 100 million users. We've gone from a, a linear increase to Netflix, I want it now, I want to binge it now. And that's what it is. People are using it within your organization, whether you know about it or not. I think the very first time um, I talked to a room of customers about Copilot, I think it was April, May last year. I was going through a raft of information. Um, I only had a couple of videos at the time, but somebody put their hand up at the back of the room. Um, and this slide had been in there before, but put their hand up at the back of the room. It's like, yeah, you've got a question. Um, and they said, this is all amazing, but when's it coming? Because we are so nervous about ChatGPT. We have no control over what our employees are plugging into ChatGPT, and we know it's an open model. So we're at the <coughs> point where we're trying to train them, or we're just going to switch ChatGPT. 
Um, we, we released um, Copilot for the web. We used to call it Bing Chat Enterprise. We changed the name of absolutely everything just to confuse everybody. Um, is everybody familiar with Copilot for the web Bing Chat Enterprise? Yeah. There's a few nods. Um, at the time, that's what I was talking about here. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, that we referred to um, Copilot uses the same large language models, it's not exactly the same large language models. There are exclusive instances of them, but we'll cover that in a moment. But really here, what we have with Copilot is the same generative AI capability plugged into um, your organization, but controlling the information that's being plugged into it, making sure that it was talked about earlier, the ability to be able to ward it. What is Copilot doing? What are people asking Copilot to do for them? There are those controls in place within within Copilot where actually you don't have that ability within ChatGPT. Um, you got the video on next to you. Is it the video on next? I so. Oh no, it's no. not. So as we said as we said earlier, Copilots are they're everywhere. I think from my last count we had sixteen. And I think you went to is it with it's fifteen it's gone to sixteen? I think the latest one is Viva. You can create yeah. your own Copilot. So there's almost an infinite number of Copilots that could be out. But it's not, as, as uh, Chris said, it's no longer something that's coming, it's here now. But how do we utilise it? What can we utilise it for to make our businesses push forward, to, to make those employees more productive so they've got more time to be creative? So just just on, and um, I don't know we've got a slide with, with, with price on it. Copilot's arrived, um, I think it was the 15th of January, we made the announcement that um, Copilot for CSP, which is what the licensing model that most businesses in the UK, like 99.9% of the businesses in the UK, by the licensing through, was available in CSP from nine o'clock the following morning. Um, the price is always an add-on um, cost, regardless whether you're a Microsoft 365 E5 customer or whether you're a customer using um, Office 365 E3, there's always an add-on cost for Copilot for Microsoft 365. That is, we do everything in dollars, $30 per user per month, I think that translates to around about £24.70 per month um, per user. Um, really, it's about the identification and the delineations of where are the right people in our business for this kind of investment, which hopefully the PM session today will help with that. But Copilot for Microsoft 365 is available now. The question around cost was asked earlier, and I don't think we've got the cost on the slide anywhere. £24.70, $30 per user per month. We do have some prerequisites. So if I said you can add Copilot to licenses, what are those licenses you can add it to? We've got that being covered later on. Now we've got the video. Now we've got the video. So we don't know how loud it is though. So yeah, so everyone cover your ears. Yeah, be prepared. We did have sound. We did have a video. Yeah. Everybody gets the gist. Yeah. So, very nice marketing video from Microsoft. <laughs> but we all know Microsoft are good at that. So, what actually is Copilot? I mentioned it earlier. It is a large language model. That's an AI that's capable of understanding and then understanding the prompt that you're putting in and then generating your response off the back of that. That model is ChatGPT4. I do believe it's going to fall turbo once that's released. And as Chris said, it's not the open AI model. It's a closed AI model that's held within Microsoft. We then what we do is we augment that onto your Microsoft graph data. So what we're doing is, yes, you could go, could go to ChatGPT, you could subscribe to that, but you've got no insights into your actual company data. You can't go and see when was the last time Chris emailed me about Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is this morning. But what we can do, is what we, we are doing is we're putting that on there. So we can get insights into that data and, and use our data and leverage our data with this AI. 
We've then got the integration into the 365 apps as well as access to the internet. Now, obviously, one of the, the questions that was mentioned earlier, or I think it was mentioned earlier, is that security. We have access to the Microsoft Graph, and, and that is everything that's underpinning Microsoft 365. So that is any emails anyone's ever sent, any documents ever, anyone's ever accessed. Uh, any Teams messages, any Teams meetings, you know, if it's been recorded, it can see all of that content. So there are security aspects that you've got to implement. You've got to make sure that only the correct people have got the correct access to, to those places. Any sensitive information, there is a possible, there is a way of, of removing it from Copilot's view. But there is all got things. It's not something that you can go and, like, we've seen this presentation, we want to go and do it today, we want to go and do it tomorrow, we're going to do it this week. You've got to sit back, assess where your data is, assess where it's lying, who's got access to it. And then implement it, put a plan into place, find those users that are going to be find it more beneficial, that do need those productivity and time savings, and then put it onto those. Now, was there, was there anything you wanted to add on this? There's only one more thing, and it's not on the screen. Um, <coughs> so there's a capability that's been introduced um, into some of our licenses, those prerequisite licenses you can attach Copilot to, and it's called the Semantic Index. Is anybody familiar with the Semantic yeah. Index? I've, I've, I've got, a, what do you, what do you know about the semantic uh, index? Someone I was looking into that I've been following it since the sort of first announcements, and I notice if I'm right that kind of the implementation of that has slightly changed over time as so well. Yeah, I think when I was first looking into it, it was basically as an IT admin, you need to take all these prerequisite steps to make sure that it can see everything across your environment. Looking real more recently, it seems like actually they're starting to implement sort of a version of that for you that just searches and picks up all that information so you don't have to. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that was one thing today. I was kind of wondering yeah. how much that do we still need to do? Yeah, it's almost been switched on its head. Um, so the semantic index, um, what it is, um, it's a little bit like your, your brain. Um, so if I ask you to think about elephants, what will happen is you'll be conjuring up images of large animals. Potentially, they'll be in Africa or in a zoo, maybe covered in mud. They'll have a trunk. Um, You'll, you'll have all these different images, contextual points you'll be associating with elephants. What the semantic index does is it goes against your Microsoft graph, your data, and it applies relationships between your data. So if, say, for example, you're asking Copilot information relating to the monthly sales report, it understands that the monthly sales report is an Excel file, understands that that Excel file is produced by Katie. Katie works in finance and she produces it on the final Friday of every month. So it creates relationships between data, it understands relationships between words. One of the things I sometimes do in a demo, I've got um, a marketing plan of, of the business and I ask what customers um, are Contoso targeting with this marketing plan? Now in the marketing plan, it doesn't reference any customers, customer names whatsoever, but what it has is target markets that they're going after. So it draws the connection between a customer being part of a target market and then provides a re response based on the target market. The so the semantic index creates relationships between data. And now, um, rather than it being kind of maybe more heavy on the admin, you've got the ability, and we don't want to go too deep into the technical piece because that will steal the session from later on. You've got the ability to say semantic index, don't look at this SharePoint. But the rest of the SharePoints will kind of go and do the work for you. Um, but that's not on the screen, but that's an important capability that helps Copilot, the orchestration engine, pull back that information at the speed of what well, you'll see later on. So. Okay, next slide. Yep. So we've got the, the, the integration into the Microsoft 365. What does that actually mean? So yes, we've got that integration into the apps into, into our data. Without leaving Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, we can get insights into that data. We can rewrite it. We can reference another document and bring that information in without having to go and look at that document. With our emails, you know, if there's a long email thread, we can summarise it so we've only got right. These are the summarised actions. This is what's left to left to action. Again, nothing so you don't have to scroll through and do that manual task. One of the things that isn't on here and, and, and that I do use is within Teams. Yes, with team meetings, one of the laborious tasks is sending a follow-up email, remembering what if you had back-to-back -back meetings. What was actually discussed and what was those follow-up points? Maybe my notes are a bit blurry. With Copilot in Teams, I can get it to give me a summary of the meeting. I can get it to give me the, the follow-up actions and assign them to the users. But all of that manual work's done. Now, the one that, that isn't on here is, is within Teams, but it's uh, called the Microsoft 365 chat. So yeah, I can go into PowerPoint, I can go into an Excel, I can go into Word and I can have insights into that data. I could also go into the Microsoft 365 chat and ask it to summarize me a document 
or create me uh, an email from a document and then automatically send it from that chat window. I don't have to go into these different apps. I don't have to look at all these different data points. Again, reducing that mundane task, I can go into Teams and with a simple chat in natural language, get any insights into any data, no matter where it lives inside the tenant. Now that, that last one is probably something that, that no one's ever seen. Has anyone seen it? Pretty new product from Microsoft. Loop, yes, correct. So are you implementing Loop? Have you got it? You've got it. One of the first people that I've seen and, and the other people are, I've not used it. Do you use it, Chris? What do you think to it? <laughs> yeah? What, what do you use it for? Um, so like if we're in a team, traditionally, if you had like two different departments and you had like a uh, notes document or something that only the IT department had access to, finance were in the meeting, you had to like ask about giving them yeah. permissions and everything. Yeah. And then with Loop, you can just like, OK, we've got this meeting with like lots of different departments together. We're just going to make a new Loop project. Yeah. Shut the link. We can all like work live in this same document within the meeting chat or within like the yeah. like email. And yeah. it's yeah, it's, it's so Loop, weird, really cool. <laughs> uh, we, we, we use it. We use it for similar ish kind of things, if I'm to be honest, um, internally. Loop is like a, a dynamic tile that you can move between locations. Um, one of the first things that we used it for, we'd have a weekly team meeting. We'd all, always be asked in the team meeting, what's your top of mind? Um, and we'd never walk away with answers because we would say what our top of mind was in that meeting. So what we did was we created the loop component and ahead of the meeting, we would all top it, populate it with our, with our top of mind so that actually the leaders in the business have visibility about what were we going to come and talk about. And everybody could just add into that. But with, with Loop, you can start that in an email and then copy the component and paste it into a Teams message. And wherever you send it, it will then dynamically update between all of those locations. If you put it into a Word document, it'll dynamically update. If somebody updates it in that Word document, it updates where it was in Teams as well. Um, so Loop components you can utilize for projects, for um, a list of tasks that you're looking to get done for the day between a bunch of different people. There's loads of different uses for Loop. Um, but um, Copilot works in the loop as well. There's one that actually isn't on the screen. It's Copilot and Whiteboard. Um, Copilot also finds a home in Whiteboard. Um, but if you've not used loop, I thoroughly recommend it, having a look. It's, uh, it's a good application. Is that this slide? Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Touched on, touched on the technology briefly. We're going to look at a demonstration after lunch. But as we think about Copilot for Microsoft 365, there's three things that are really important um, we think to consider. The first one, security foundation. Actually, we were talking earlier about what does Copilot have access to, what controls are in place, all those kind of things. Um, super important um, to think about security. And then AI at work. So. Who are the individuals in our organization that are going to benefit from this investment? Um, how do we make sure that we're spending £24.70 per user per month extra on licensing? It's, there's nothing else that exists that's like this. So it's not a case of we're going to go switch this off and turn this on. You can't switch security off and turn this on because you need security. So actually, this is in like, all likelihood you'll need to make cost savings somewhere else or it will need to be incremental investment. So who are we going to give it to? Who are the right people in the business? And then also culture shift. It was re referenced earlier on when Stephen was talking about a bank of individuals, very clever individuals that have been given AI, um, but they're not been trained on it. We actually did a, we did a, um, myself and Andy did a session, um, a partner event, and we pulled up um, two leaders of our respective businesses and the partners and ours up on stage. Um, and what we gave them the task of um, was we're going to give you a job description. Um, we're not going to tell you what's in that job description, what the specifics are the individual needs to go and do. Um, we want you to review four CVs and we then want you to pick the candidates you want to interview. We want you to write an email inviting them to interview and we want you to also write an email to the people you don't want to write in, invite to email uh, in, into, into interview. Um, and what <laughs> the, the, the catch there was is one person we gave co-pilot to, um, the other person we didn't give co-pilot to, and me and Andy were in the middle and we had Copilot. Um, we knew how to use Copilot, but the individual that didn't, didn't know how to use it. And at the very beginning, when we said, how do you feel about using Copilot? Their response was, I haven't got a bloody clue how to use it. 
So even though we'd given him access to the technology and we'd been very clear on what the requirements were within it, he didn't really know how to engage within Copilot. And even when he tried, he didn't engage with it in the same way that we did because we knew how to use it. So the culture shift will all be around, one, collaboration between people in the organization. How are you using it? What are you getting it to do? What's working? What's it not doing for me? What, what, what is Copilot? I'm trying to get it to do it. It'd be great if it did this, but it's not doing it. Saving other people from potentially wasting their time or thinking about a different way in, in order to get that task done. But culture shift will be important as well. So security foundation. Um, as it builds again. Um, Copilot um, respects and understands the principles of the organization. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, is it really depends on what security is implemented currently within your business. So think about SharePoint controls. Copilot can understand um, an individual's rights based on SharePoint controls. Um, information protection at the document level. Um, Copilot can understand that as it goes through, it checks, it checks that information, it understands those points. So what Copilot doesn't do is it doesn't apply an additional layer of security. Copilot isn't a security solution in Copilot for Microsoft 365. What needs to be there in place beforehand is those zero trust principles as we referred to earlier, like just enough access, the right access for people in the organization. Because I can quite imagine, and I've spoken to a lot of customers in the last eight, 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 eight months or so, um, there might be nervousness in the business about what information is Copilot going to find for people? Are they going to try and find information relating to people's wages or various different things in the business that they shouldn't be privy to? Copilot does not give people access to things they don't have access to. It just makes it easier for them to find things they do have access to. So really data governance, the security foundations, data governance is super important to make sure that Copilot's only referencing the information that's right for the individual. So it respects the security, compliance and privacy of the organization and responsible AI is built into the solution. And we're continuing to build on that. And even if we think about it from a from a user interface point of view, um, it's it's Copilot, it's not autopilot. Um, and if, we th if I think about how you engage it with Outlook and when you'll see it later on, when you engage with it in Outlook and ask it to draft you a reply or a new email, it opens it up in a sandbox. So it doesn't just put the text it has generated to that email into the window so that you could just hit send. It puts it into a sandbox and then you have to say, I want to keep it, I want to regenerate it, or I want to discard it. There's no real ability to click Copilot and then just hit send on the email. There are multiple steps in place where the user is required to just ratify this is accurate. And, and that's another important consideration here is that you, the user is always in control. Has anybody heard of the law firm in the US that used ChatGPT to generate some arguments for court? Is this the one where the um, judge throws out the yeah. sort of line? Yeah. They, <laughs> ChatGPT can pass the bar exam um, and some uh, lawyers in the US uh, looked at it and thought this is amazing technology. Um, we're going to see if it can do some some grunt work for us. We're going to see if we can get it to just create and um, find us some create us. It did and um, find us some case law to get our, our, um, our defendants case thrown out. They rock up into court. They look at this is amazing. They rock up into court presented to the judge. Um, the judge reads it, checks into it, comes back and said, this isn't real. This isn't real case law. It's fictitious. ChatGPT made it up. Um, they were fined $5,000, I think, each. They're now being sued or were being sued by their client for improper um, representation. What they then said was, um, we didn't realize it's, it's, it's so clever. We didn't realize it could make something up. They didn't check the work. Um, and what the judge said in that circumstance, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it's pretty close, is, there is nothing improper in utilizing AI um, in court preparation, but make sure you check the output. So even in Copilot, if you ask it to create you a blog post, create you a presentation, do, write you a draft of an email, it's always incumbent on the individual to make sure that they're happy with that output. Um, that sandbox piece that I talked about in Outlook helps with that. The individuals need to make sure they read it. AI will make mistakes. It will save a lot of time, so much time. I'll talk through an example later on. 
Um, so um, my other half of the weekend, loads of time. Didn't save me any time because I had to do it a little bit. But um, save loads and loads of time. But making sure that we're indexing a little bit of that time on checking what it is that Copilot has done, and we're happy with what it is that it's presented. I suppose on that as well, there is always that asterisk where AI-generated content may not be correct, and it puts underpins that and everything. I suppose echoing what Chris said, it is getting off an initial stumbling block, get someone off an initial stumbling block. It's not going to do the work for them. It's there to work alongside them. So um, I've, I've already talked through some of these points, data access and permissions. So SharePoint controls, information protection. Hands up in the room if you're familiar with information protection and SharePoint controls and completely understand it. No, OK, cool. So um, we're going to divide the room in half. Everybody on this half of the room, you have access to a SharePoint. You are on the list of people that can access the information in that SharePoint and everybody on the right hand side of the room, you don't. You don't have access to the documents in that SharePoint. Um, if you ask Copilot to tell you information relating to the marketing plan and the information is hosted in a document, Word, PowerPoint, whatever, in that SharePoint, Copilot um, will have indexed that SharePoint and will return an answer to you, probably pointing you back to the document that it found in the SharePoint. That's what it's going to do. And for everybody on this side of the room, Copilot's going to come back. And unless it's something that's in your emails or in a Teams message, you don't have access to that SharePoint. If that is the only location that information is in the business, Copilot's not finding you that information. It's just going to come back and say, sorry, I couldn't find anything relating to that. Now, somebody on this side of the table, we're going to say Richard, takes a file out of that SharePoint and moves it into another location, another SharePoint in the business. Um, doesn't mean to share it with everybody. Um, we actually only wanted to share it with Becky, um, but that's what's happened. Copilot now um, will find that document in that new SharePoint location, index it, and realize that everybody in this room now has access to that SharePoint. So it then understands that the access for, the, for that document to be for everybody in the organization. We've not meant to overshare it, but that's what's happened. Information protection at the document level helps to prevent that because information protection follows the document. So you've seen it at the top of a document where it says highly confidential, general, you've got the ability to be able to create classifiers or run with the existing classifiers that are in place. And um, what information protection at the document level ensures is if we move it from one location to another, still only the right people have access to the right information. Um, You'll see in the technical session later on the orchestration and what Copilot goes through, um, but it checks all of those things. So not only SharePoint controls, but also information protection at the document level is really, really important to make sure that if somebody does move documents around. There's a, there's there's protection there. The good news is in a vast majority of the licenses that Copilot can be attached to, those capabilities are included. So it's not buying extra things. It's just about making sure those things are switched on and configured. Would um, it tell you that there is a document, but that you don't have access to it? No, 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 so you no, can't see it at all. No. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Um, what would happen? Say you mentioned about um, someone moving it to another SharePoint. If that was a mistake and then deleted it or moved back again, what happens to yeah. Somebody wakes up and thinks, oh, what have I just done? I need to reverse that. So I move the document out of there. I now make sure that actually there's permissions that associate it's still now only with this side of the room. Indexing after the first index has taken place is done in near real time. So what happens is every single time you send a prompt to Copilot, it's checking the rights. So if you have updated the rights of a document outside of that circumstance, um, maybe you switch Copilot on already and you've walked away from this meeting thinking, oh, we didn't look at information protection and SharePoint controls. Um, and you now start to look at that um, and switch those capabilities on. Well, Copilot is going to go and run the orchestration at the point you put the prompt in and understand those permissions live. So it's a good question. If you undo something that you did by accident, Copilot will understand that because it runs it um, as you put the prompt in. Um, and the other thing as well to, to think about here, um, customer data protection. Um, your organizational data here is being engaged with. Um, so there's, there's always going to be a degree of concern, but it respects your tenant boundaries. Um, so 
when we talked about large language models earlier on, Microsoft is publicly available, have invested a shed ton of money in open AI. So you might think, are we taking the organizational data and connecting it to ChatGPT? It was referenced, no, these are exclusive instances hosted in our Azure open AI service. So you should have comfort there. Open AI don't actually have access to the models that we host in our um, Azure open AI service. Um, but you should have confidence there that actually, okay, cool, we're not taking the data and we're connecting it to ChatGPT. But even those models that exist in our Azure Open AI service, we are not using them. We are not using the organizational data to train the models. Um, we are, we're, not, we're not training the LLMs that sit there, the large language models that sit there based on the prompts of the, the individual going in or the data in your organization. Um, they are there purely to reason over the prompt that comes um, from the individual as they push it in. Um, and the other thing as well, um, in terms of user and tenant focus, one thing that's maybe worth considering um, is the where the where the where the data is within the organization. Um, SharePoint and OneDrive are two typical repositories that individuals might use. Think about where are we indexing information? Is it is it is it over indexing in OneDrive? OneDrive is for me, SharePoint is for we. So actually, if you're wanting other individuals in the organization to be able to relate information that might sit in everybody's OneDrives and they've just been creating sharing links, but should they really be in SharePoint? Really, the, the organization of the data maybe needs to be looked at. But all of that information can be looked at in the admin center. Um, but where, where are we seeing the data in SharePoint or in OneDrive? Before I talk about AI at work, because we've gone past security and we do have a technical session later on, are there any questions on any of those points that we've run through so far? No. Okay, cool. AI at work. So um, there are a number of different roles that uh, Copilot can can help individuals. Um, these are just a few on the screen. We're going to talk through three, I think. Yeah. Um, HR. Yeah. Marketing and sales, wasn't it? Yeah. HR, marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. um, but in the demo that we run after lunch, hopefully you'll start to see some of the capabilities and maybe think about how different people in different roles within your business would benefit from Copilot. Um, but we're going to we're going to focus on um, three different roles. I'm going to talk about um, HR, um, and I'm going to talk about the one that's on the screen. Actually, I, I said it happened on Friday night. I'm at home. My other half, um, my darling wife, she is the HR and employee relations manager for a port in the UK. Um, we are expecting our second child at the end of May. Um, she's going to be going on um, maternity leave in a in a few months. And what she was saying is, Chris, she said I might need to use your co-pilot skills. So what do you need to use my co-pilot skills for? She said, well, we haven't done an interview um, uh, for a HR and employee relations manager for a little while at the port. And what we want to do is we want to create a new case study and activity that the individual would need to complete as part of the interview process. So, right, OK, you've got the job description. Have you got the JD? Yeah, I've got the JD. Right, OK, cool. So because we can we can point co-pilot at the JD, help it understand what the requirements of that individual are, and then ask for it to create as a case study. Within 20 minutes, um, I have got an interview document with six competency based questions, probing questions that can be utilized afterwards, a two page case study that described a scenario that was happening at the port with the requirements of the individual to then respond to at the end of the 45 minutes they're given to prepare um, what we need to see, um, how they would approach this particular challenge. Um, she sat there and she was like, this would have taken me hours. This would have taken me absolutely hours to write all of this up, make sure that my my my, my thinking was sound. I would have had to bounce it off other people. Copilot became the sounding board, if you will. There's things on the screen that um, that it can help with crafting a job. Oh, yeah. So you said the criteria is the user so we went through the internet, search everything with the job description and come. No, so um, the job description already existed in a PDF. Okay. So in Word, um, because you in, and you'll see it later on in the demo, you can reference documents that already exist to ask Copilot to build something based on those documents. Um, so the, the, the job description already exists. So all I asked Copilot to do was First off, I asked Copilot to create me some interview questions, some competency-based interview questions. 
um, that could be pointed at this particular job description. And then I built on that, asking Copilot further as to, I wanted it to create me a case study. That's one of the things as well that I've taken as a, as a learning from engaging with Copilot is if you have a rask if, if you have a project you're looking to execute upon, telling Copilot the 58 different points of your project you need help on, breaking it up works better. If we think about how we delegate work to individuals, um, breaking things up into smaller tasks will always provide a more optimum output. How many times have you asked somebody to do something and you've given them maybe too much information or too much vagary and they've come back and they've fibbled it to something and it's not what you asked for? Um, whereas my experience is breaking co-pilot tasks up um, helps a little bit better. But crafting the job description, um, summarizing the interview notes, drafting the offer, all these different things you can get co-pilot to help you with. Um, HR might be around writing new policies as well within the organization. Um, before we touch on the next um, user role, um, again, like it was, I don't know, it was about five months ago, um, Danny, my wife, she's working from home. She calls me over, she said, Chris, I need your help with something. Um, of course, it's something to do with the Microsoft application. She said, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create something in PowerPoint that is like a process flow. So if this happens, do this, and if this happens, do this. Okay, cool, I understand, this is how you do it. And I said, what are you trying to do? And she said, well, we've got this new policy that we're introducing at the port. Um, and what we want to do is we want to create a training document that the managers of the port employees can then take the um, dock workers through so that they understand the new policy. And of course, you could just give them the Word document, but um, they want to create a training document. That's probably not unique to, 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 to their business. Um, and it's not as simple as just copy and paste all this word into a PowerPoint, because that's not typically how you land training. Um, but anyway, it did. It took her hours to, to create it. And then a few months later, I showed her the video where you can reference a Word document in a PowerPoint um, and have it create a presentation for you based on an existing Word document. She didn't talk to me for about um, 10, 15 minutes. She weren't very happy when we reflected back on that. But there are so many different things just in HR. Three things on the screen, a couple of things that I've just described there that Copilot can help people with. And people will find new things that that I, you know, I potentially haven't even thought about engaging with it in other individuals that are using Copilot haven't thought about. I suppose that's the when you talked about that culture shift, it is about those feedback loops. Because as, as Chris said, we I'm West Coast Cloud work trial in, in our organization. You have a weekly meeting where we go, right, where have we find those pain points, where have we find it helpful. Without that feedback loop, something that I say or something that someone else might pick up on the way to use it might go amiss, and I'm the one reporting that information. Um, yes, sales professional. So again, real world example. Um, I you know, come and do these types of things quite a lot, speaking to our partners, speaking to our partners' customers, helping them understand how they can use Copilot in their day to day lives. Now, while I'm doing all this, my emails are backing up, and my emails are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time I got back to them, you know, it says 58, the other day it was 70. On top of that, I had Teams messages that I had to go back to as well. The majority of those, I'm going to be honest with you, I was looked into for no reason. I was a marketing asset from Microsoft that I've been said because from the Microsoft tech community that didn't have any value to me. What I can do with Copilot is I can then go into Copilot and highlight emails from James Thurgood about Copilot or highlight emails from uh, someone particular that I'm looking for. It will surface those emails quicker, so I haven't got to do that manual task of trolling through. Now, I suppose one thing that I should say before I, before I go any further, these are all tasks that we can do every day. These are all tasks that users will be doing every day. What we're doing is we're handing off the admin job, that the admin task to the AI, so we can spend more time doing things that do go to our job, that are making us be more productive and creative. So I found those emails from those new senders, from, from that person that I want to, that I want to speak to. I can now get Copilot to draft me an email to that customer uh, or that person. I can use Copilot to use an existing document to get the reference of what I'm trying to get across, whether that be a new product that we're trying to push or order around Microsoft 365 Copilot. We can get Copilot to do all of that work, do that initial draft email. Again, I'll have to go in there and edit it. I'll have to make sure that it's got the wording correct. Sometimes it can't sound like an AI, but I'm not going to sit there and think, right, how can I translate what's in my head onto this piece of paper? It's already doing that work for me. 
We then move into, let's say we offer the customer a meeting. Within that initial email, we can actually ask Copilot to book in a meeting time. So it'll look at my calendar and say, right, you've got a free hour on Friday between two and three. Should we suggest this or should we push it back to next week? Copilot will do all of that work for us. Let's then say we want to go to the meeting and we want to make sure that we're prepared for that meeting. Now, let's say last week I had a meeting around Copilot and the best way is to, to prepare, the best way to propose it to, to a customer. Now, and the best way to utilize it. I can get Copilot to recap that full meeting and give me the highlights, give me the four bullet points that are the main points that I need to figure out with Copilot. Um, and then when we go to a presentation, again, like Chris said, going into a presentation, manually the change in the presentation, is a laborious task that isn't going towards what, what I want to do, which is speak to customers, speak to people, create relationships. So what I can do is I can use Copilot to take an existing template and append it with any information that I want, so whether that be a new logo, or a new bit of information or, or a new pricing. And this one is pricing. Well, I've given all of those admin tasks to the AI. Again, these are not jobs that I wouldn't be asked to do anywhere. I'm just passing them off so I can speak to customers and, and come to events. Let's then say we're in a meeting. I'm in a meeting with, with someone and they're asking questions and we all know what it's like. Two, three questions in, you forget the first question because you, you're answering it and the, the, the conversation is flowing uh, as they always do. Those first initial questions might go unanswered. They might go, by the wayside and that customer actually wanted that answer that was something that was important to them but you know in the time they forgot in real time copilot can look at the transcript understand what's been said what's been answered so i can just ask copilot are there any questions that have gone unanswered what has chris williams mentioned in this in this meeting what are the main points what was actually discussed if i joined work if while i'm in that meeting copilot can do it as well as that following the meeting it can look at the transcript and i can ask it like what was discussed, and I can ask it all those same questions. In this example, what it's doing is those meeting notes, those, that, that follow-up action, is all something that we have to do. But you know, we might be in back to that meeting, we might only get back to that to write that draft three, four hours later. We've got a few notes, but the notes aren't very concise. They aren't, you know, we just jot it down quickly. Copilot can look at that. He can look at the transcript and say, right, these, this is what was spoke about, and then put follow-up actions at the bottom of that. So we can send that out. You don't have to worry about remembering. Copilot will do all, the, all of that remembering for us. Again, we're not doing anything groundbreaking. We're not doing anything that we wouldn't be doing anywhere. We're just giving it off to, to the AI. So we can spend more time, in my case, speaking to partners, speaking to customers, speaking to partners. And um, anything that you would like to? I think, I think the only thing I ever need to remember is to hit the Copilot button. It's like a, a muscle memory that needs to be created because I don't hit transcribe or record on every single Teams call that I jump into. Um, but the um, yeah, the amount of time I've saved. And the other thing as well is, when you're note taking, are you really focusing on the conversation because you're taking down notes based on what you've recalled from the conversation so far? So you miss something. Do you ask somebody to, what what was it you said again? Um, or maybe you don't ask that and you just don't catch what it is that they said. Um, the difference here is one, the ability to just truly focus on the conversation with the individual you're having. Copilot does the heavy lifting on the note taking. Um, I suppose on that, we, I rang Chris last Friday uh, about an issue that I had. <laughs> I then said, I started turning the issue, like, wait, 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 I need to stop. I'm not hit transcribe. I'm not going to remember all this. Yeah. Uh, I need to send this to my manager, Chris was like. So let's hit transcribe, let's start again, and I'll get that, give that summarised action to them. Because I'm not going to remember all this. I'm not going to remember it in the detail that you're telling it to me. And, yeah, and it would have taken Louis time. Um, would have taken Louis time to write it up in an email and send it to me. But actually, what he wants to do is verbalise what the challenge is. So Louis verbalises what the challenge is to me, so that I understand it. I can probe and ask questions because I did. There were a couple of questions that I had. Um, the copilot then captures that. Um, I then wrapped that up in a summary so that I can send it on to where I need to send it on to. But yeah, back to the point is that muscle memory of have I hit the copilot button or have I hit transcribe. That's the muscle memory that needs to be created. And it's important to know, originally, originally when Copilot was, um, was, was talked about in terms of getting access to it in Teams, a lot of what was seen was recording a meeting. There is no requirement to record the video in the meeting if you want Copilot to go to work. Minimum requirement is transcribe. So when you hit the Copilot button, it will start transcription because what would happen at the top here is you would have a Copilot symbol if you were had a copilot license, it will start transcription. The same thing happens, you get a little pop up at the top of the screen that indicates that transcribing has started, happens for everybody on the call. You can only 
activate Copilot when you're in a tenant um, or a meeting in the tenant that you are in. So if, say, for example, you're working with a customer and the customer sets up the meeting, yes, you have Copilot. Yes, they have Copilot, but you can only activate it when it's based from your tenant. Um, but even if anybody else, nobody else on that call has Copilot, you can activate Copilot. You could then not that you want to be the designated note taker, but you could be the designated note taker to save everybody hitting Copilot and getting Copilot to summarize themselves. Only one person needs Copilot in, to, in order to get that summary. It just has to be based on the tenant. Um, um, just on the transcription, the how does it correct? Because when we use transcription, we're you know we're using company names and things and and it garbles it a yeah. lot of the time how do we get it to learn those terms like my company's called anitox yeah. never does it yeah 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 and, and and so the transcriptions that it provides are garbled yeah so it's it's a good question technically um am i 100 percent on this um no but if I think about what we were talking about earlier, what a transcription does is records the words based on as it understands it and then prints those words out. What Copilot is doing is reasoning over those words, sending that information through the orchestration engine that you'll see later on. The semantic index is applied. It understands relationships between data um, and then goes to the large language model, comes back, provides you with the summary that you require. One of the things that we talk about is grounding. Grounding improves the prompts, but um, my experience so far in reading a transcription document versus getting a summary from Copilot, I have a much better experience in getting the summary from Copilot than when I do reading the transcription natively, because that's just capturing what it understood that it um, it understood to have heard, but then isn't processing that information to say, right, how is that relevant in terms of your business context? Copilot applies the relevancy in terms of your business context. Um, but again, I think you'll see um, we're going through the orchestration later on. Um, we are we are making improvements from the voice yeah. side of it as well. Yeah. But it is very separate services. So it's, it's a separate crack <laughs> sense as well. Isn't exactly, it? and that's the yeah. same same problem. I think all I know I know Microsoft and Amazon both yeah. have the same problem with with AI bots and things where it's trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, tone concepts alongside accents and people are constantly trying to break it with, with very yeah. interesting accents but yeah I'll try, on on. Word. I'll try to put one on on the next call yeah. <laughs> what is your specialist requirement for one of our users who has a disability is it possible to automate co-pilot so it automatically switches on and does the transcription um if transcriptions um, no, there's no ability, I think, in the admin that I've seen, the ability to just automatically switch Copilot on in a meeting. The button has to be button has to be clicked. I think it's the same with transcriptions as well. Yeah, it's definitely something that's been explored, especially from, from that side of um, accessibility. Um, I think that the problem that it, it creates is, is that divide of, I guess, sort of corporate data and corporate accountability to user and functionality and yeah. sort of making the experience better, but also is that information that the company wants to have saved and recorded. So I think there's a fine balance there, but it's definitely something we're exploring. Okay. Thank you. Just going to say anecdotally, uh, I think you can turn transcription on to start, start remembering it, because I did it by accident and I don't know how to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, long as, as, long as, as long as the transcription is there, Copilot can engage with the transcription. And so I'm pretty sure you can't switch on Copilot as default for the meeting. But if transcription can be activated as default, then you would be able to engage with Copilot okay. through the transcription. Okay. What does that is it from um, as a Teams Rooms Pro or something? Just good, there. really good question. Um, Teams Premium. Um, yeah. So I, um, this this comes up occasionally, um, but it's a really good question because. Um, Teams, Teams Premium is uh, an additional class license. Um, I think there's a promo on it at the moment, but it's typically around about $7 per user per month. Um, and there are a raft of different features that were, were talked about um, when Teams Premium came up. But one of them that came out um, and was uh, quite popular was Intelligent Recap, which was the ability to be able to summarize um, a meeting um, post meeting. So Teams Premium would allow you to get this AI generated summary from what had been discussed from that meeting. Now, I think the other thing that we think about as well is, um, and I'll come back to that point in a minute, but there are more capabilities in Teams Premium outside of just intelligent recap, like watermarking. 
So if you deal with sensitive data and you want to make sure that there is a watermark of the user's email address over the screen when they join a meeting, you can apply watermarks, therefore protecting the information. Um, custom lobbies. So if you're going to use it for interviewing or if you use it to host customers, you can customize your lobbies that they wait in before something. There's a raft of different capabilities there. Now, how does it differ when we think about intelligent recap? Um, and co-pilot because I'm getting an AI summary, I'm getting an AI summary, you can engage in co-pilot and probe. You can ask questions, you can interrogate it. So you'll see later on when I go through it, I ask it to generate a summary for me. It actually might be very similar to the summary that Intelligent Recap produces through Teams Premium. But what I ask it is, uh, I always ask a question. I, was, I, I missed a meeting the other day because I, I was double booked. And what I was doing side by side is I asked Copilot at the end, towards the end of that meeting, um, had my name come up at all? Had any actions been assigned to me in that meeting I couldn't attend? So Intelligent Recap gives you that summary response at the end uh, through Teams Premium. Copilot, where well, you can interrogate. So if it tells you in the summary a decision was made, can you tell me more about that decision? How did we come to that decision? Were pros and cons discussed? You can interrogate the transcript. Copilot provides you the response. Um, so, yeah, a very similar feature. I'd say Copilot has more depth um, to its recap capabilities. Um, and so another example that we've 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 got on the screen. We've um, I mean, we've talked through a lot of the capabilities and we're going to see them as we go through the demonstration um, later on. But um, we think about if we think about an individual working within a, working within a marketing role and I talked about whiteboard and loop earlier on um, also um, the ability to be able to transcribe in Teams meetings and um, describing through natural language what it is that the campaign, the new product you're looking to take to market, the new service offering. Um, what is this campaign looking to target? Allowing Copilot to take all of that heavy lifting, but then take that information and transpose it into a Word document. So actually now what I've got is I've got a bit of a skeleton to our marketing plan. Then in Word, getting Copilot to help you with refining what that marketing looks like, marketing plan looks like. Have I got a SWOT analysis? We haven't got any KPIs assigned to this. Could we recommend some KPIs for our marketing campaign? Um, and this is one of the examples I'll run through later on. But now we have our marketing plan. We need to present that to the board. So I need to create a presentation based on the marketing plan. We've got it hosted from the Teams meeting that I've moved into Word. And we've been collaborating on that through co-authoring. I'm now going to look at it, um, at creating a presentation of it. No need to start from scratch, take that marketing plan that we've got in the Word document, jump into PowerPoint, cre create me a presentation from this file. Does it get you 100% of the way there? No, and it, it shouldn't be really because it, you will always should always have to edit something. Um, I, I, I've never had it create a presentation for me and thought, right, OK, that's it. I don't need to do anything. Um, I'm quite fortunate. I don't actually have to engage with Copilot in PowerPoint that often um, because actually Microsoft corporate um, do a really good job of knocking some slides up for me. So I don't have to spend too much time in there. The other thing as well is um, how do we how do we interrogate historic marketing campaigns? How do we learn from previous executions that we've had? Again, not on the screen, do we have an Excel that has got click through rates or social media campaign um, success rate execution? How do we interrogate Excel to understand where are we winning? What posts were working on what specific days? It's a raft of different things somebody in marketing could get Copilot to help them with. Um, it's about that exploration. Um, and dependent on specifically what they're executing at that point in time. I suppose on, on that PowerPoint piece, so I create a lot of PowerPoints. I'm like, Chris, I haven't got a marketing team that can create them uh, at will. So I have to create them, and then I go to marketing and say, actually, that's the wrong colour. And you haven't got the, the title in the, the correct format, and, and it's actually not in capital letters because everything needs to be in capital letters. Now, before, that was in a manual task that either I had to do, or if I, I, they had time, they had to do, they had to go through that full presentation and edit it. With Copilot, you can put in um, you can put in themes, so you can say, create me, um, create this document, recreate it with this theme, and it will do all of that work for you. So now, a task to going through a presentation that's already been created, it's going to take me you know, not hours, but maybe half an hour, forty minutes. But giving it to, again, giving that task to an AI. Yeah, and a question um, get asked uh, quite regularly is around. 
can it work with our organizational templates? Because for some people, when you open an upset Excel, uh, PowerPoint, so a PowerPoint is just a blank document, whereas actually if you've got organizational templates loaded, what it does is it loads it up with maybe a footer at the bottom and a header at the top for your business. Yes, if the providing you've implemented it, um, Copilot will open up and engage with organizational templates. Um, or um, if you don't have them, it will create PowerPoints. But obviously they will um, depend on how many are created as to how start how road they will start going from maybe the feel of your business. So organizational templates is what a lot of businesses tend to use. The final one um, I'm going to touch on um, is culture shift. Um, so I'm, I mean, I mentioned it. I mentioned it earlier on. Um, it was actually in uh, one of those studies. Um, it was the first one that was released last year in May called Will AI Fix Work? What leaders said was people will need to learn new skills. Um, and if we look for it, look at it from a rudimentary point of view, prompting, <coughs> nobody was talking about prompting before ChatGPT really. It wasn't, wasn't part of my vernacular particularly. Um, the other thing I talked about earlier on as well is the art of delegation. Um, how are we asking Copilot to help us with the tasks that we've got? What are the words that we're using um, in order to get the output um, that we require? Somebody in um, West Coast, actually, when I was doing a podcast with them, said something that um, knowledge is power is typically what we're taught. We're actually now the questions that we ask is the power because all the information is there you know, at our fingertips. It's just about how we're coaxing that out of um, the generative AI models. And that's the same with getting it to help you with your task that you have in mind. So I think a lot of people, um, it won't just be about giving them the technology, it will also be about helping them understand um, how to get the most out of it. Um, but I think we've covered, a, we've covered a, definitely one of these questions um, already. What common questions we hear from customers if we think about that final part um, in terms of getting ready for Copilot for Microsoft 365? So who do I give? the first seats to, um, don't like the word seats, that's an internal word, licenses, um, who do we give this capability to? Um, how do I get employees up and running quickly? We're we spending a reasonable amount of money. I want to get a speed on that return um, of investment. We want to get an outcome as quick as humanly possible um, to make sure that we start to see that return. And in order to make sure that we have an understanding of what we're getting out of it, we need to make sure that we've got a way in which to measure impact. These are questions that we, we hear quite regularly. Is there a common question that you've been thinking of as we've been talking through this or you've been walking um, walking towards the meeting today that isn't one of these that you're thinking burning? I see there's a lot of figures on kind of how people become this percent more productive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, have you seen it? it might be the right anecdotal, but sort of what that time to start trust in the model is? So we've got one license yeah. that we're going to start sort of turn around just to start dipping our toes in the water. Yeah. Like I knew for me personally, as an IT admin, it's I'm still struggling to maybe completely hand off that trust element of could I use that or would it have actually been quicker if I just did it myself? Or like you say, with the legal case where it completely made something up. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Can I trust that answer? Yeah. I was just wondering how you've seen that play out. Yeah, so I, I think. It depends on what the rollout looks like, because the scenario that you've described, it's it's actually what we're seeing from a lot of customers. When we made it available in CSP, we said that originally back in November, it was you had to order 300 licenses. You had to be on an enterprise agreement, you had to order 300 licenses. And every customer that I was talking to was like, I, I was speaking to a 6,000 user organization. They said, We're, we want to proof of concept this. We don't consider 300 users to be a proof of concept. That's a touch large for a proof of concept. But what we've seen in terms of customers doing is activating a license. The guidance that we're, we're trying to give to customers here is think about, um, think about that proof of concept approach. And the statistics we provide um, are 20%. The way in which I verbalize it is maybe look at a user in a few different departments. So it's not about covering 20% of the organization, but create, and I talked through it in the following bit, create a cohort of individuals that can have that open discussion. Louis referred to it earlier on about how there are five or six people in West Coast using Copilot. They have a weekly meeting in where they talk about what have we been doing with it? What have we been trying to get it to do? What have we not got, got it to do? Um, 
and that isn't quantifiable, right? That's not quantifiable, but there are dashboards that help you to understand how often are people engaging with it to create them presentations? What time savings are we estimating that they're making based on that? There are dashboards for the quantifiable metrics, but the speed in which to get people there, I find is better when you've got other people to bounce off. Um, and and you're, you actually raised a really good point there, which is also important to know. This is a user-based license. So the license, if you give it to 30 people in your organization, and we actually had a private preview customer that came in and said that they did this, um, you can move that license to somebody else. If, if you invest that money um, and uh, Tommy is not using that license, you've gone through multiple conversations, they've had the training, you're seeing it in the dashboard, they're not using it, you can move that license somewhere else. Um, but the, back to the point around the proof of concept, having a number of individuals across various different departments helps for those various different disciplines, people that engage heavily in email, respond to customers, um, maybe create PowerPoints, engage with Word, the various different use cases, you understand where are they using it, why are they using it, how are they getting on with it, what's it doing for them, what's it not doing for them, so that you start to establish um, where it fits in your business. Um, the, some, of the, some of the studies that we've done, um, what of the earliest adopters taught us, that Work Trend Index um, article that was on the right-hand side of the screen, that's got some outputs that we've seen from people, quantifiable outputs in specific applications. Um, but you will have access to your own dashboard. It only enriches the more information it has access to. Um, but I think we're going to be covering the dashboard a little bit later on. I suppose just yeah. just on that as well. So like I said, we've got we had five licenses. The marketing team was like, right, we want access. So we're like, right, we've got our renewal coming up. Let's let's add a more a few more licenses on there. I went over to the marketing team yesterday and I was like, ah, see, he's got four pilots. He's like, yeah, what do I do with it? He was sat there and was like, what can I actually do? You know, so I had to sit there for an hour and go, right, you're an Excel. They had a marketing fund. They wanted to find out just high level stuff. What was the the marketing activity that was giving the most investment? by um by activity type so we started off and it was again if we go to that culture shift we put the first question in and it said oh it pulled wrong through the wrong information because we didn't word the question correctly i was like right so then what do you want to get out of this so we then changed the, the wording slightly put more information then it pulled the truth but actually i'd like it if it included this and then we put that in there and we went into uh we went into uh word and we did some things in there so if they would have just given that license and they hadn't been told or someone hadn't gone on to them say Right, you know, what are you trying to do and what can we do? Because like I said, they were both just sat there like, well, I've got this this new tool, I've got this license, but I actually don't know what I'm doing with it. It's like, you know, Pandora's box, but I actually don't know how to use it. Uh, do you have any assistant tool or anything for the Microsoft that it might be integrated yeah, Really good question. <laughs> assessment layer? Um, no? no yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we don't, we, I, I can touch on assessments now. So. When you say, what what do you want the assessment to do for you? Uh, like the security really. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely do have assessments. So we have a we have a funded program called um, a solution assessment program. Um, when I say it's funded, there's no cost to the customer. There's no cost to the partner. Partner, better um, pull on these assessments um, now. Um, and in that circumstance, we request an assessment as long as um, we are more than 30 users within the business, an assessment can be ran and you haven't had one in the last 12 months. Um, but in that circumstance, we'll have the baseline security foundations will pull information from secure score to understand MFA activation, information protection, docu data loss prevention um, policies. Are they all activated and in place? Um, we do all of that. Um, pull the information together, host it in your environment, but we pull the information together, we create a report, and then ultimately um, everybody jumps on a call, has a chat through that report, and we say, these are the things you need to focus on in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Are you ready for co-pilot? Are you not ready for co-pilot? And if you're not ready for co-pilot, what do you need to think about doing? You've already got the licenses, but you need to switch on these capabilities. Um, or you don't have the licenses. One of the first things you'll need to think about is how you license your users. But we realize you're using third parties for your endpoint protection or your endpoint management. You could consolidate into Microsoft 365 and drive some cost savings. So those assessments 
they are available. The Beckler account team can support you <coughs> within get with the getting access. Um, nominations are normally um, responded to within about 72 hours. And the time frame to get it executed can vary, as you can imagine, because it's based on everybody's availability. Um, but typically the engagement can last anywhere in and around the six week mark. So yeah, but yes, we do have a session. Going back to the data, can you ask the system to actually say, say where the sources of information came from? Yeah, so Copilot, as a matter of fact, um, will always in its responses help you understand as to where it sourced information from. Um, you'll you'll see that um, when we go through it later on, you'll get like an asterisk, one, two, three, four. I, I go spotting on LinkedIn because I look for LinkedIn posts now and I read through the text on LinkedIn and I look for numbers after a sentence because <laughs> it indicates that, that person got generative AI to create it for them and maybe didn't remove the numbers. Um, but yes, um, it will cite its sources, um, both internal and external. So we talked earlier about the ability to be able to also have Copilot reason over information on the internet. That is configurable by the admin. You can say, no, I don't want the users to have information from the internet. If they want that, they can go to Copilot for the web. Um, or you can have it so it's toggle toggleable um, so that the user can determine whether they want to see information from the internet or not. Um, but when it sources information from internal, it will tell you its sources. When it sources information from the internet, it will tell you its sources. So just that into that in that case, does that mean that you've almost got a non-return valve so that if it's going to the internet, is it possible for any source of information from inter internally to get to outside, outside of your business? So what you're saying is um, we've sent an information, we've sent a prompt into the internet um, to the to the large language model, can it exit your business? Yeah, so basically can any information that's is looking at within the business, yeah. can that be shared to externally? No. Or is it still kept within the tenant? No, all of the information that Copilot reasons over reasons over respects your tenant boundaries. Um, the large language models are hosted in Azure OpenAI service. Um, so yes, it will connect to the large language model to reason over it. Um, what it does is it takes an excerpt of that prompt, the question it needs to answer. So maybe you say, can you compare um, our new store openings uh, or our most recent store openings found in this file with our competitor B&Q um, and the size of the square footage in those stores? It will understand that, right, OK, I don't find this B&Q square footage information internally. I need to go and switch, search the Internet. Yes, the toggle switched on. I'm going to go and look for square footage size of B&Q on the internet because it doesn't have that information hosted um, in your environment. So no, it doesn't doesn't send the prompt to the internet, it sends the prompt to the large language model which is hosted in Azure. Um, just to um, touch on some of the subjects, you mentioned about you can introduce um, certain SharePoint sites. Yes. Can you do it based on like sensitivity levels? Good question. So can you can you have the semantic index, not index uh, labels that are highly confidential? So regardless what SharePoint they're in, if it's highly confidential, semantic index won't look there. Policies. Policies. Yeah, SharePoint policies. Yeah, so you can. Yes. See, I, I, I did say I would spin up questions, and Andy <laughs> said that Georgia. hopefully I'll have the answer <laughs> to the questions that Chris spins up. Um, OK, conscious of time, because we're about two minutes away from lunch, and I never like, like to stand between people and lunch. But there is a couple of bits so I want to touch on. I have on. one small question. So once you say, once I search something and go to the Azure AI thing, so will they tag like my company, like they're least trying to search something in the internet or something? Will they tag the company name who is trying to search in the internet, what information a particular company want to search, something like that? No. So has anybody used Bing Chat Enterprise or Copilot for the web? Yeah. So um, with because Bing Chat Enterprise, Copilot for the web, for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. We're, we're taking a prompt and we're then using the internet as it is now to pull information to help inform that prompt. Um, Microsoft don't have eyes um, on that prompt. They don't use the prompt to train the large language models, but they take the metadata from that prompt and securely um, deliver that into the internet, pull the information it needs in for the large language model to reason over it. 
Um, but no, it's not um, It's not sending a notification to say Bill's Bagels um, have sent this information over to the internet or this prompt over to the internet. Um, it's not, it's not um, highlighting your company has done it, no. Um, so, as we think about um, adoption within the business, what are some of the things that we need to think about? Um, I've touched on it earlier, concentrate licenses um, into a few key teams. I think um, trying to at least get an individual or two within different teams across the business where you think it has relevance is really the best approach to making sure that you start to drive that open discussion about how are they getting on with Copilot. Um, and the other one as well is, you know, is there an AI strategy in place? It talks about an AI council, but is there an AI strategy in place? Copilot for Microsoft 365 is one like AI solution. There are, I mean, we're already using AI probably in the business in some way, shape or form anyway already. Is there an AI um, council or strategy in place as to how we're going to utilize this capability, not only in Copilot for Microsoft 365, but more broadly, to make sure, one, that we can improve customer experience and drive better productivity, um, efficiencies within the organization. Um, have we got a council or a strategy in place relating to AI? And then as we think about adoption, again, we kind of touched on it earlier on, is we've, we've got these, these bank of individuals as we've identified. Really, ideally, they would be collaborative um, individuals, um, open for communication, um, maybe technology advocates. Um, we saw the statistic on the screen earlier on that said 70% of people or 77% of people um, wouldn't want to give Copilot back. When I saw that stat, I thought the stat would be higher. But we think about people that work within the business, you've maybe come across them where change adverse, like they get given this new thing, they can't figure out how to work it and they write it off as a solution. I'm already good at my job, I don't need this anymore. Um, so the, the individuals within that cohort will help explore, they will, they will interrogate, they will push it, they will do what they need to do, but they will communicate it um, effectively within the business. Manage expectations. Louis talked about something earlier on. People in the marketing team found out that others in the West Coast business have got access. Can we have some please as well? We want Copilot too. Actually, if you're managing expectations in the organization by sharing, we are going through a trial where we are reviewing Copilot. We are reviewing Copilot with a number of individuals in the business. These are the things that we're going to do. We're going to help you understand what we're learning. We're going to help you see what it is we're getting it to do. And we're going to keep you on this journey. What that then does is it eradicates the pressure on we want it and we want it now. We want it and we want it now because actually they understand. Maybe other individuals in the business that don't have access to it have been speaking to people that do have access to it in other businesses and they can start to communicate ideas. So having having kind of like a, a transparency to the process you're going through um, is really important. Communicating best practices, I've touched on there. And then quantifying the impact, you know, having that meeting between the individuals engaging in the, the council. Um, I don't have a I don't have the dashboard, unfortunately, but what I was referring to earlier on, this is a screen snip of the dashboard um, or one of the tabs within the dashboard where um, Copilot will help uh, the Copilot dashboard will help you understand how are people engaging in PowerPoint, in Word, in Outlook? Are they getting it to draft them a presentation or are they getting it to summarize a presentation? What are the average number of presentations in the last month that a user has got it to create for them? Also with associated time savings that we expect that that would have driven for that individual. Um, but you can understand it um, from an individual perspective, but you can also anonymize it and look across, across the business more broadly. But I mean, as with any new solution in technology, you look to put in place what you want to make sure that you can do is you can quantify, right, what are we seeing? Where are we, where are we, um, where are we driving success? Where are there some more challenges? Maybe it's not that we need to take the license off somebody. Maybe it is that as a, as a test bed, you delivered two types of training, um, one super intensive that took more time, the other one not super intensive. Well, these people over here that didn't have the super intensive, they're not using it as much, so right? We now need to now go and invest in the super intensive. Um, whatever the reason behind it, you, you have the ability to be able to review the insights. Um, this is not where you would audit it um, for clarity. The auditing would still be done in the admin center um, through things like e-discovery and purview, but I think the team will um, touch on that a little bit later on. Um, and the final point before I um, shut up and let somebody have, everybody have something to eat, um, prerequisite licenses. Um, so what are the licenses that Copilot for Microsoft 365 can be attached to? 
business standard, business premium, E3 and E5, Microsoft 365 and Office 365. That's new. That was only announced in January. For any um, customers that were looking at Copilot before Christmas, they probably would have expected to see those top licenses there. But Office 365, E3 and E5 are included. And also um, A3 and A5 for faculty. So Copilot will be able to be attached for faculty users. Like March um, the 1st. March the 1st. I suppose when we look at that as well, so Office E2, when we talk about information protection and securing the information that's in the organization, because Copilot is as simple as putting a license on, but what you need to do is you need to make sure that data is secure so you're not surfacing, again, surfacing that wrong information to the wrong users. Can you do that with an Office E3? Does it come with that information protection? No, it doesn't. So when you're looking at those licenses, or a business standard even, it will be the premium ME3, ME5, using those AI, those tools within Microsoft that have got to make sure that that information is secure and it's not going to be surfaced to those wrong users. Um, what else can you do to get started? Um, if you're one of the ones that wasn't nodding um, about Copilot or Binkler Enterprise in terms of not having seen it or had a look at it, um, all of these licenses that we referred to beforehand, you can switch that on for free. There is there it's is on by default. Sorry. Oh, actually, if, if the if the licenses have been added post August, it's on by default. If the licenses were added pre August, which I'm maybe thinking that you've been using Microsoft 365 for longer than that, then it is switched on by the admin. I'm not technical, as you maybe have already guessed, um, but I switched it on in my demo tenant um, within about three or four minutes. You can switch it on at a user, group, or organization level. So as, as long as the individuals have access to one of those prerequisite licenses, it can be switched on. So quick question. We as, as a tenant, we have Office 365 A3. Yeah. That's not on this is Microsoft 365 A3. That's different, right? Absolutely. So, so that means we can't attach that to us. Currently, yes. Yes, um, you would need to be on Microsoft 365 A3 or A5. I state that at the moment because prior to January the 15th, it was an Office 365 E3 and E5. The semantic index capability wasn't switched on for those licenses. Whether that changes, um, no idea. At the moment, the prerequisites are A3 and A5. Um, but really, as we were talking about assessments earlier, that might be the discovery around what other technologies that are utilized that you're utilizing. Um, could you maybe roll into Microsoft 365? And typically, we find customers have a cost saving. You know, if we're providing providing email, or not we, but if another company is providing email security, endpoint protection, endpoint management, um, identity, all these different things, um, Microsoft 365, A3, A5. Um, have these capabilities built into the solution. Um, so an assessment might actually be something that would be worth looking at. Understand file permissions, um, data loss prevention policies, Paramount, just because it's available now, doesn't mean go out and buy it. I want everybody to go out and buy it quite obviously, but I want everybody to do it in a way that makes sure that their business information is protected. Um, so making sure that the right permissions and policies are in place is really important. And if this is completely all new, um, there are a few hands around the room where it's like, have you been looking at this before um, today or is everything new to you? Um, maybe exploring a little bit more about what we talked about in that work trend index. How are other businesses looking at AI? Um, and if you've already got started with Copilot and you're thinking about how do we drive adoption in the business? One better have got a range of different services that can help you with that. But there is also a website that you can look at called um, our Adoption Hub. That is not unique to Copilot. There are um, adoption guides, training materials, OFTs that can be sent out to employees. Those are really good stuff in there to help drive adoption of a solution within the workplace. Um, but those are some of the things that we can think about getting started with. I think, and then it's over. That brings us to the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>
a listic place that you can engage with Copilot in that can reason over the business data. You can break out from chat, but um, ultimately you can reason over multiple data points in there. You look at Outlook, you look at Teams, you look at Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and um, you look at kind of those core applications that people probably spend the most time in. Um, and what are some of the things you can think about um, engaging with Copilot in and around in those apps? So, let's see how this goes. Yeah, this is going to be live as well, so I'm very concerned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being, 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 being confident, being, yeah. being the tech representative, I can't fault smarter. I've used to do a live demo so far, um, just in case as, as anyone who's ever tried to do a live demo or not. Cool. Um, Can everybody see that? Is there a way to um, uh, spotlight this so that uh, focus on content makes it a little bit bigger? Um, can everybody see that? A few nods, cool, happy days. Um, now, one of the things, and I'm going to start off with summary, but one of the things I've watched people when they do demonstrations or talk about Copilot is they say, oh, you can summarize this and you can summarize that. It's capable of far more than just summarizing things, but one of the things that actually is quite useful for people, I'm going to look at it on a, on a, on a desktop, on a, on a laptop, um, actually, I was watching a blog that somebody was delivering, a CEO of a business um, who started using Copilot. He was saying that summary while he's on the mobile is actually really useful because trawling through what are sometimes long email chains on the mobile is painful. Um, so the summary feature on mobile is helping him out, but also um, then the draft on, on the mobile is helping him out as well. But we're looking at it from a, from a desktop perspective. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask. What are the functionalities available when you're interacting by mobile? Same same functionality. Right. So um, I can actually, if anybody wants to see it, because um, me, Andy, Louis, have you got it on your mobile? Uh, yeah. Have, Stephen. So if anybody wants to see what it looks like on a mobile, we can we can do that um, separately. But yes, yeah, same functionality: summarize an email, start a draft response, or start up a new email. All those kind of things are there um, in the applications. The same on mobile as what they are um, on the applications on the desktop. And sorry, just another. And obviously, you've got to be in new Outlook. Good question. Yes. Because none of my none of my users will use it. Because it's rubbish. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people. We don't like change. Really no, yeah, no, no, no. We, we, I like change. I'm an advocate. Not an outlook. Not, not an outlook. I don't like change. But <laughs> I, I used the event client exclusively because I couldn't. Yeah, I, uh, there, are, there are changes that I've, I've, I've felt some pain through. Um, this isn't about Outlook, this session. No. We want to go through Copilot, but yes, we're covering technical prerequisites a little bit later on. Um, and for part of this demo, I'm going to be in the web. For part of it, I'm going to be on the device. The main reason for that being is I don't have any pre-recorded Teams meetings that I can show you, whereas in the demo environment, there are pre-recorded Teams meetings. Um, you don't want to see my um, my outlook. Um, plus, I don't know what's going to come through to my outlook. So, um, for a few different purposes, we'll do online, and then we'll move into the applications where where we've got the ability to do that. So, we've come back um, come back from 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 a day off with Outlook in the inbox. The first thing I realised is I want this person's inbox. Like, where the bloody hell is everything else gone? Um, if I looked at the calendar, I'd be like, what's going on? Um, but we see that there's an email chain. Um, actually, it's probably not the longest email chain that I've seen in my life, but it's an email chain nonetheless. Um, and what I want to do in this circumstance is I want to jump into it, I want to have a look. Now, you can see immediately um, what I'm greeted by here is summary by Copilot. Um, I can re read through the email, I can reply, forward the same things as you would normally see, but if I hit summary by Copilot, what the, what the engine's going to do is it's going to read the text, understand the text, and then relay you a summary. But what you also see that it's done is it's relayed you in a summary in the order that the emails have come through. So what you sometimes do when you look at an email that comes through and it's a really long chain, you start from the bottom because you want to understand, understand the context. What you might have caught yourself doing in the past is you start reading through the chain as, um, as you see it, but then you're like, oh, actually, no, I need to start from the bottom. I need to understand the context from the beginning. Copilot here has said, Nesta Wilkie reached out to the team to discuss ideas for a marketing campaign. Lee Goo suggested something. Grady suggested something. Adele suggested something. And Megan suggested something. So here you can have an understanding broadly throughout that email chain, what information has been, um, has been relayed. Um, now I've kind of got that understanding. 
I want to reply to the individuals. Now, immediately when I've opened up that reply, you can see draft with Copilot appears. I also have the Copilot button at the top here where I can engage with Copilot. I can draft with Copilot, I can get coaching. Maybe you don't want Copilot to write your email for you. Maybe you want to write your own email, but you want Copilot to give you some feedback on what that looks like. Is it too formal or are you not, you're not presenting it in the way that you maybe should do? In this circumstance, we're going to draft with Copilot. Um, before we start drafting, another thing to, to note here is you've um, got the ability to be able to amend um, how you want Copilot to think about drafting that email. So do you want it to be direct, neutral, casual, formal? Make it a poem. I don't know why you want to make it a poem. <laughs> I remember this is a shared demo environment, and I remember jumping in here about three weeks ago for a customer session. And I couldn't, I, it didn't twig in my head, but I couldn't figure out for the life of me, like, why is it moving all the text over to the left hand side of the screen when it's generating an email? Actually, it's rhyming. Like, what is going on? Um, I um, remember that make it a poem was an option. We are introducing a new feature, a new feature is coming. One of the things I always have to do when I get Copilot to generate an email for me is I always have to change the end of the email. Um, anybody that receives an email from me um, will definitely know it's been generated by generative AI if it doesn't end in sheer C. All of my emails end in sheer C. Um, whereas it doesn't pick that up at the moment, doesn't understand my tone in emails, but there is a feature coming called Sound Like Me, where when you ask it to draft your reply or create you an email, when it goes to the large language model, it will also understand your tone and how you are normally in communications with people? Do you start something, do you open up an email always with, hi, how's it going, or whatever it might be? It will take that information and it will put it into the draft that it creates oh, for you. What, That's not normal. do that then? If it's got access to all of your previous emails already? Yeah. Well, to, to a point, it does and it doesn't, to, to very quickly challenge on that point. So as, as, although it's part of your data set, from the point of activation, that's when it starts to build out that, that sort of that brain of intelligence as to who you are, what you do, how you operate, who you communicate with. That's from day one. It doesn't go, oh, you've worked here for 10 years. Let's now scroll through 10 years worth of data on that first prompt you've ever written, the first question in your organization, and give you 10 years worth of qualified data. It's the first time it's ever heard of you. It's the first time you've ever asked it. It's only going off what it has access to, which is the first thing you've ever asked it. So over time, that adoption period will allow for more qualifiable sort of measurement of, of more data but from the off you're just asking it a very straightforward question to get a very straightforward response because it doesn't understand the context as to well how does this map to greg in hr who you spoke to 700 times this year but actually you've never spoke to him today so it doesn't it's not got that association we, we describe it a lot like sort of neural pathways they need to be established they need to be grounded they need to be built up and until they become connections it's the first time you've ever said it from a co-pilot's view it, it's can resonate with that as part of the graph, but that's a ongoing process as part of that adoption. Yeah. I actually had somebody ask me the question, is there going to be an option coming forward that says, don't sound like me? So <laughs> I'm always super straightforward in my emails and I get moaned about it all the time. Um, there might be a bit of profanity here and there that they, they said as well. So, um, I mean, with regards, I talked about indexing earlier on and the, the information that it has the ability to be able to pour over. And as with any solution we release, and also other companies release, they evolve over time, new capabilities come in. If we look at what Teams is now versus what it was when it was first launched, it's a very different solution. Um, so Copilot will own, co for Microsoft 365 will only continue to grow. Um, so um, this is, earlier I was talking about the sandbox. This is the sandbox I was referring to. <coughs> So we, we're going to draft a response by Copilot. What I'm going to ask it to do, um, thank the team, three, four, there, five years. So while Chris is doing that, if you see him suddenly start pretending to be a DJ, it's because he's trying to keep my laptop unlocked with the prompts that he knows to write. Um, otherwise, he's going to just scramble, change the prompts, get a very different response than he's expecting, and, and then throw the whole live demo out. Yeah, to his own. And there's a specific reason for that here. So I've popped in, thank the team individually for their ideas, suggest we start with a social campaign. So I'm now asking it to generate that draft based on a medium size um, with a casual response type. Um, and what I end up with, um, hi team, wow guys, you guys have been amazing. I'm impressed with all the creative ideas you've shared. Thank you for your hard work and enthusiasm. I agree with Megan, Adele's idea of collaborating with influence is brilliant. I also love Lee's suggestions. There's a raft of information being relayed in here. I asked it specifically, thank the team individually. 
So what it's done is it's gone to the email that understands the context of the email that's calling out everybody individually as to, as to what they've talked about. I haven't told it what they talked about. It understands from the context of the email what they've talked about. If I was to rewrite that prompt, remove the word individually, I might end up with, and we'll do that in a moment, might end up with something broadly similar, but what it wouldn't do in that circumstance more than likely, or not definitely not guaranteed to do so, is start to acknowledge everybody <coughs> individually. But that's where we were talking about earlier, the art of prompting, the skills that sit with prompting, dependent on what you ask it to do, is how specific you are as to what you're going to get out of it. It's, it's the case in even getting it to draft your response in an email. Um, but I've now I've got its uh, I've got its response. I can keep it. I can discard it. I can regenerate it. I can be um, specific about something I want to change. I can go back to the prompt. So the original prompt that I wrote, if I click that, it brings the prompt up. I can then say, right, actually, um, I don't want to thank everybody individually for their ideas. Thank the team for their ideas. I suggest we start with a social campaign and I'll draft the email response based on that. Um, again, it will go to work. It will generate that response for us. Um, and one thing that you'll notice here, um, actually, it's called out a person. Lee suggested the social media content. That's the campaign. I want. That's how I want to start the campaign. Um, it's called out Lee's idea, but it hasn't then called out everybody else's. But one thing that's worth pointing out here, it says two of two at the top because you've You've gone and you've asked it to engage again and draft you another response. Actually, I quite like the first response um, and I want everybody to be called out individually. If that's the decision you're making, you don't lose that initial response that Copilot gave you. You can go back to that um, alternate response. Even, even the same if you hit regenerate. Maybe you don't change the prompt whatsoever and you just hit regenerate. You want Copilot to try again. Um, Copilot with regenerate will still give you the ability to be able to um, go back to previous responses. The other things um, that are worth calling out as well, you may or may not be able to see it, definitely more difficult for those at the back. Um, AI generated content may be incorrect, that is called out in the sandbox that the individual is engaging with. There is the ability to be able to feed back um, thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, that is optional for the user um, and essentially then they will have the ability to say, look, I asked Copilot to do X and what I ended up with Y and she would have equaled Y. Um, they can give feedback so that our engineering team can continue to look to improve um, its capability within the application that that feedback is um, put in context to. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that. Um, so I've got my, um, I've got my email response. Um, here from uh, Copilot. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to get Copilot to coach Copilot um, so, so that you can see what the response looks like in that circumstance. So I've got it to populate the email content into the into the box um, where I could hit send if I want to. Let's as I say, um, say for example, you've you've started to draft up a response to yourself. Um, some of the feedback that Copilot's given is could be more formal. Um, I did select a neutral tone in terms of its in terms of its format sounds enthusiastic and supportive. Do I want it to sound enthusiastic and supportive? I do. I'm happy with that. It's not necessarily coaching that it's a bad thing. It's just making sure that it catches your tone before you send it. You know, I think most people have potentially read an email and thought, what am I reading here? This doesn't sound great to me. Or you've stopped yourself before clicking send on an email. Copilot can coach on that. Um, and is there enough clarity? Try adding more details. Um, so whether it's your asking Copilot to draft your response from scratch, reply to an email or coaching in the email. Um, this can be done on the desktop, also in the application. And as I say, regardless of if they're engaging in email, this is definitely a time saver for people. Um, there might be those emails that come through and you just need to say yes to something. They need Copilot to help you with that. Um, but there will be occasions where actually there is a more considered response required. Copilot can start with the first draft. Maybe there are specific context points that you need to add in um, that you've not put into the original prompt and you need to amend. But Copilot in Outlook, um, as I say, will allow you to draft and create those emails as well as summarize. I know that's the first thing that people tend to talk about with Copilot. And just on a point that Jason said earlier about from an accessibility point of view, how many emails would you know, someone with dyslexia? get through a day or how many times how much time would they spend on just checking, putting it through different sites to catch spell mistakes or 
grammatical errors, that process of, of it being sort of caught in that draft process can sort of make everyone sort of best sort of person you know, step forward for, for their day of work, but really allow them to have a level playing field when it comes to just general professionalism, general working practice, expectations around how people communicate, it's going to make it much easier for everyone to get involved. So we're going to have a look at it in Teams now. So this is this is applicable in a live meeting. Um, what we're doing is we're looking at a meeting post because we're kind of in a meeting, but um, uh, we're not we're not activated Copilot in which to interrogate it. Um, but we're looking at a meeting post. So we can see that in this meeting, Lee Gu, Megan Bowen, Lynn, Isaiah, and Alex Wilber are in attendance. In this circumstance, I am Alex Wilber, so I was actually part of this meeting. Um, but um, if I go into recap, jump into Copilot, the question was asked around Teams Premium um, earlier. Um, Teams Premium gives you the um, intelligent recap post meeting. Whereas Copilot, you can see um, somebody's done it in a different language here. This is a shared demo tenant, as I mentioned. I'm going to start again at the bottom in a moment. Um, but some of the things um, that you can, you can let it get done for you create a table of participants and their roles. You can see the response that Copilot's done here. Um, Lee, Isaiah, Megan, Alex, Lynn, all accurate over to the left hand side. As long as um, through their, I, their entra ID, we understand what the roles are of those individuals, or if they verbalized it in the meeting, um, it will um, stipulate what their role looks like within the business. You'll see the little asterisks um, here. This is where, if it's not related to their ID, where has it got it from in the transcript? So we can see Lee Gu mentioned on the integrated marketing lead for Project Falcon. So you can go back to a specific point in the transcript. Not necessarily relevant if you're looking at just people's roles, but if you're talking about a project and a specific challenge, you might want to go and interrogate a bit more. See your hand. No, just, just a question actually. We're trialing the transcripts on, um, yeah. on other, not just um, Copilot, but other, um, other um, vendors going into Teams. Yeah. And some of the ones we've trialed, you, know, you can introduce it in the same room, for example. To introduce yourself and then they kind of then it then it will transcribe you as that person. Whereas I've been them to do that co pilot as you No, so this is it's a really good question that was asked. Uh, this was a while back. Um, and the scenario we're describing, we're all in a meeting room. That meeting room has joined a Teams meeting. So I was asked the question: if I talk during that Teams meeting and we're in a meeting room, does it know that I'm Chris? Um, no, it doesn't listen to my voice and understand my voice and then understand that whenever I'm talking, it's Chris. Um, at the moment, um, if there are three individuals in a meeting, in a meeting room, it will assign actions to the meeting room unless those individuals have stated, um, uh, yeah, it's Alan, I'm going to pick those up. Or somebody else turn around and says, Alan, you have to do that. Yeah, I'll pick that action up. It will understand from the transcript that Alan has picked the action up in either circumstance, but if it is literally, I'll do that, it will assign the, the action to the meeting room, um, which what I've found myself doing in those circumstances is almost becoming the narrator for Copilot. Yeah. Copilot, for your benefit. You will change your Exactly. Life. Yeah, exactly. There's a, I, I don't think that will be a forever thing, um, but it's a good flag. If you're in the other ones we've looked at, does do that. You introduce yourself and then it will record you. So. Yeah. And they kind of get the knowledge of the one. Yeah. It's a, it's a it's a it's a really good flag. I think what I'm what I found myself and what I've been talking to customers um, about at the moment is you will dependent if if that's the kind of scenario you find yourself in multiple people in meeting rooms, um, you'll find yourself um, adapting what you do in a meeting because you've realised after the first one or if somebody's told you if you're all in the same meeting room you need to be more um, uh, explicit who is picking up that action. Um, so we can see a raft of different things that it's pulled back here, but what we're going to do is we're going to ask it a few different things. So you can start to reason over um, response time. So let's go with create me a table of participants and their roles. Also include what actions were assigned to them. Because um, um, maybe, um, I mean, the, the first point, I, I think I actually used this following a call with the West Coast team um, about a week or so ago. Um, list of participants, their roles is important, but actually at the same time, why would you not have in that same table 
the actions that might have been assigned to those individuals. I haven't actually asked for it if there is an end date, but what the end date is for those actions. Um, but here I've asked it to create me a table of participants and their roles, also include what actions were assigned, and give Copilot the opportunity to respond and come back with hopefully what is a table of participants, roles and actions assigned. But then that table can be taken and transformed and popped into an email. So here we've got lead the integrated marketing lead as an action to share the latest marketing launch plan and form the leadership team. Um, Isaiah, who works in the operations work stream, needs to provide a product readiness update and speed to use usability testing. Um, so there are various different actions that were agreed on the meeting. I've now got that in a table. Um, I could ask, um, can you tell me more about any challenges discussed? See if there were any challenges discussed. Actually, one of the questions that I always, I mentioned it earlier, one of the questions I always ask Copilot um, if I've not attended a meeting, so were there any actions on me? I haven't asked that yet. Um, some of the challenges discussed during the meeting were the launch of Project Falcon was delayed by two weeks due to usability <coughs> testing issues. The event had to be um, kept in January to avoid negative publicity. Um, so there's various different things discussed here. Okay, so were pros and cons discussed um, around the decision to delay. Now, in the previous prompt, I made an error in my typing. It was me, yeah, um, but it had still managed to pick up what information you pulled through. So I'll start with a quick question. So I noticed there are some different languages there. Yes. I don't understand the language. Could I ask Copilot just to put that into English? Yep. Or it's just a quick convert yep. that into English and that's it? Yeah, so, absolutely. So natively, it'll go into whatever language your client is, is configured to uh, yeah. or your tenant policies. Um, I think we're supported up to about nine or ten languages now, or, or maybe more since go live. Um, but it'll always default to your, your native language. Anyway. So this is sort of the different Yeah, so, so someone's obviously asked for specifically. Um, but if that was the case, or an international client or international right. company, um, and it does come in through another language, or someone's purposely asked for the prompt to come in a different language, you can then just say, okay, translate, translate that prompt. When, when you hit transcript, transcribe in the in the top of the box. Um, now it asks you what language you want to transcribe that in, because maybe the default language on your tenant is English, but actually the audience you're engaging with is different. Um, but yes, you can engage with Copilot and ask it um, to present in a different language. Um, but one of the things I mentioned earlier about you can get a summary, but you can interrogate that summary and be more specific. Tell me more about this. And what we've seen here is Yes, there was a de decision, a conversation around delaying the opening of a store. Um, what I'm curious is, was the pros and cons to that decision discussed and were there any narrative that could be supplied around this? Um, and yes, it will help me to understand, but again, linking me to the points in the transcript where that was, that was discussed in particular. If I want to go back and view the transcript, I can do, but again, I can continue to engage with Copilot. Um, Final things I think I'll cover here. Um, so at the bottom, you've got um, a prompts option, which will kind of give you some suggestions um, for what you could potentially look to discuss with Copilot from the meeting. Um, you can hit the copy button, um, which takes it onto the clipboard so that if you say, for example, wanted to take that original table that it gave you, and that's your summary that you're going to send to somebody, um, you can then copy it to clipboard, send it to, um, send it to Outlook. Um, and again, you've got the ability to be able to feedback um, with regards to your experience in engaging with Copilot within this specific um, application. And how many days it will be saved in the Copilot? How many days does the transcript save? That's based on the tenant retention rights. So I don't know what it is by default. I think it's 90 days. Uh, yes. I think it's 90 days. But you can change 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Yeah. Right? So it, it depends on it depends on um, what your retention policy looks like for transcripts. As long as the transcript's there, Copilot's got the ability to be able to engage with the transcript. Um, so it really depends on uh, the retention policy. Cool. So. Um, Right, where are we? Um, I'm going to come out of this. Now I'm going to do another look. Word. Maybe right over here. So, um, what we've got here is a, 
um, mocked up marketing plan, um, Word document. Um, I've got the Copilot pane open on the right hand side. I'm going to close that at the moment. I don't need that at the minute. Um, what does this document include? I could ask Copilot, but we're not going to at the minute. Um, um, Adventure Works marketing plan, um, company overview, target market, marketing objectives, marketing strategies, um, budget cost analysis, implementation plan, um, and conclusions. So there's some information in here. Again, maybe not the biggest Word document, but it's a reasonable Word document nonetheless. Um, now, one of the first things that um, you can think about doing with Copilot um, is we've already got a document. So do we need Copilot to create us a new document? Maybe not. But maybe there's a particular section um, within it where you're not quite sure on the wording. So when you highlight a, period, a portion of text, you've got the ability to be able to rewrite with Copilot. So you can add, get Copilot to create you um, three different possibilities for that particular portion of text. Or you can get it to visualize as a table. Um, we'll do that with something different in a moment. I'm going to just ask it to rewrite with Copilot. Um, and again, what we end up with in this circumstance, similar to what we saw in the Outlook um, experience, is the ability to be able to cycle through the three different possibilities that it's provided you with. You can insert them below, replace it, or you've got the ability to be able to adjust the tone. I've not adjusted the tone in that original response, so I just said rewrite with Copilot. At the moment, it's set to neutral. Um, actually, in this circumstance, I'm going to keep it at it as it is, and I don't really need to do anything else. Um, but down the bottom here, we've got target market, and we've got some commuters, we've got some recreational riders, we've got different types of customers that might be engaging in our product. Um, Visualise as a table, will take the portion of text um, that you're selecting um, and do exactly as it describes. It will give you an option that would potentially create that into a table format within the document, um, saving you the job of doing so. Maybe it's just reams of text and you want to break it up to make sure that people consuming it um, find it more palatable. Um, rewrite um, is there as possibility, but you can also visualize as a table. Um, here you can see how you can engage with that table. So for example, remove a row. Maybe you want to add a row or you want to add a column um, with other data relevant to that particular type of customer. Um, it's created the first draft of that table, but you can continue to build on it with Copilot. I'm going to bin that off. The final thing that we'll look at before we um, open up the blade is when you go into a blank space in a Word document, whether the Word document has text already in there um, or whether it's just a blank document, um, describe what you would write, like Copilot to write for you. Um, so I can reference a file um, or I can, um, can you forward slash. Um, uh, by hitting forward slash, what you're doing is you're saying to Copilot, um, start looking for files. Um, and then I can start to type in the name of that file and I could say, right, okay, can you um, can you add a SWOT analysis based on this forward slash competitor information? Um, so when we were talking earlier about um, the, the well, I was mentioning earlier the situation that I had with my other half and she was wanting to create that training document um, in PowerPoint, which we'll see in a second, you can use the document in it to add information or start from scratch. Now, we're not going to do that in this circumstance because we'll do that in PowerPoint. One of the things that um, is quite um, useful um, on occasion, I would say, is the Inspire Me option. What Inspire Me does is it will read through the document, it will understand the context of the document, and it will make a recommendation about what you could maybe also include. Um, some of the things that I've uh, I've seen it do in the past, <coughs> actually, it's a useful, useless one. And thank you for your attention and interest in the marketing plan. So it's basically suggesting, based on everything we've supplied, Put a thank you message at the end of it. We'll give Copilot another another example, another opportunity to regenerate. Um, but some of the things I've seen it include in the past are things like a SWOT analysis. Um, it's recommended maybe think about adding a SWOT analysis to the marketing plan. <coughs> um, so here it's making some recommendations about what we could do to make sure that um, our, our marketing plan is as successful as possible conduct market research, develop a clear brand identity, use a mix of online and offline channels, and create and distribute relevant and valuable content. 
I've not given Copilot any instruction whatsoever. I've just said, inspire me, understand and from the <coughs> context it understands and um, from the document. Whereas, I, as I say, if I wanted to, I could I could tell it um, more specific. But again, you've got the ability to be able to roll through the various different um, the various different responses it provides. Yeah, some good examples of how I've seen that implemented already is simple things that you know, customizable statement of work. Something's quite new for an existing or a new client. Referencing their agreement, referencing the right terms, so you're not having to go and find how many products they've got with you, how many devices that they've got, how many are under support, how many are on which version. You can just reference the document and say, as per this agreement, can you tailor the statement of work to include what we're going to be actually doing this part of this product or this project, or then referencing other documentation that's relevant. They might have some DOUs that already exist. They might have you know, some product descriptions that exist in yourselves internally. Not having to go in and summarize or rewrite them. You're just pulling it out of there, citing it within this, and giving that sort of personalized feel to, to a new document. Um, and that was not engaging in the co-pilot pane that I had at the open at the beginning. So in the co-pilot pane, um, you've got again the ability to go and view what type of prompts can I engage with co-pilot around. Um, I can create, add a paragraph, um, draft a business plan, um, create a high level overview, um, et cetera. Um, I can understand about the document or I can ask questions and I can interrogate. So um, how big is the FAQ that we've got internally on oh Copilot? Which version? Yeah. <laughs> it's huge. It's so, about a year's worth of questions and answers. In. Yeah. So um, what Copilot allows for anybody, anybody if they've got a big word or a PDF in front of them, it's control F and you can search through the document for a specific word, but you're doing a keyword search. Um, ultimately, if that isn't the word that it's described as in the document, you're not getting a response. Whereas with Copilot, um, I talked about the semantic index earlier and the ability to be able to create relationships within data and words. Um, can you help me to understand the customers this plan is targeting? Um, so. I don't believe, we'll find out, um, I don't believe customers are specifically talked about in, um, in this particular plan, but actually what I was referencing earlier is what it does talk about is target markets, um, and therefore during the correlation between the fact that customers are part of a market, um, so it should hope, 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 hopefully help with an understanding as to through what customers are we targeting, what part of the market do they fall in. Um, and we've got, according to the document, um, so the target market for AdventureWorks, e-bikes and retail stores, those same types of customers that we were talking about earlier on, um, eco-conscious, eco specific demographics, recreational riders, urban commuters, um, none of them have the specific word customer called out. Um, so if we were doing a keyword search in that circumstance, we're not pulling that information back. Um, whereas with the Copilot, it's not only pulled the information back for us, but we want to go to that specific location in the document again where you see these hyperlinks you can then go to that specific point in the document if it's reams and reams and pages and pages of information <coughs> and it's found that location it's found that information in page 64 um, it's going to take you to page 64 so you can read further if you want or you can continue to ask go the questions and the most important as well is the uh, just go back on track yep. so just on to the site and um, the the what where has he got it from what has it got it from yeah. and then how has it got it so that reference in the sensitivity labeling the document that so if you've referenced multiple documents throughout or one in your last prompt it's telling you just as a quick snippet that this is a document it's our payroll data it's the statement of work you used yesterday it's secure it's confidential it's general whatever that is it's giving you that just quick context to know exactly what is citable whether that's from an auditing purpose or just you qualifying that you know it's co-pilot for a reason you're the pilot so very much you qualifying that it includes the right work that you, you've asked for it to include, the right sort of data, you can just quickly check those those citations and, and validate them essentially. That's not fun with this one. So um, now we've got the marketing plan sat in another location. Um, what are some of the things I can get Copilot to help me with? Um, Copilot um, 
can help you understand the information from a presentation. So again, summarizes a possibility of asking Copilot. But some of the key things we could ask it to do is create a presentation, not from a file, just from scratch. Just give it the context of maybe what we're doing the presentation to include. Create a presentation from a from a file or add a slide about something specific. But we're going to ask it to create a presentation from a file. Um, we've got the AdventureWorks marketing plan that I was just looking at. Um, we're going to send that across um, over to Copilot. How many pages was that? Six pages. Um, six pages of text. Um, now, what ends up happening here, um, hopefully, is we'll end up with a kind of a raft of different things that it's going to build out in that presentation. So, as we start to see, the outline for that presentation is we're going to um, one, uh, call out a bit of an introduction, company overview, target markets, using the sections that are in that Word document, the context in that Word document to be able to determine what are some of the sections of the presentation we want to build. Um, it's always worth making sure, I kind of think that that's accurate. Um, is that accurate in reference to what was in the Word document? I can always go back and check. Uh, one question. The speed of creating the slides depend on the hardware, like how much RAM process and everything they are connected. Like the people have the uh, laptop, like simple laptop or somebody have the advanced laptop. I think it depends on the content. If, if it's so very content, graphically content. intense or it's yeah. huge, non, it's a 60 page document, a 600 page document, that will always pay a factor for the resource that's doing it. But when you're doing this either from the um, from the client or from the web version, it's very much going to come down to it depends on the task you're asking it to, to perform. So it's always going to base it on the amount of information it's having to process, um, but it's not strictly down to whether you've got uh, a gig RAM or 12 gig RAM. It's just very much going to be it will go faster with any task from you from your laptop if it's got more resource, but it's still going to be processing it as well as the resource side of. You know, uh, I guess graphically integrating it into the slides as well. Yeah. So the the beauty of live demonstration is you'll end up with times, and I, this is this is my experience um, when I've used it. I've had it create presentations for me. And I quite like the format of it. I quite like the color that's just displayed there. I'm not using a template. I'm allowing it to use its creativity. In this circumstance, actually, what we've got is a rather minimalist presentation that's been created, black and white text. <laughs> Um, with some imagery being included on some of the slides, um, not necessarily the type of slides that I would, I would potentially want to use from a business context, but um, it's created me um, what is a 25 slide presentation um, across those various different areas, incorporating the information from the Word document. Has it created the final version that I'm going to use? No, definitely not in this circumstance, not, not likely in in pretty much most circumstances we get it to create. But it's got me that first starting point. One of the things that it's talked about here is you can also use Designer for adjusting layouts. Is everybody familiar with Designer? You know what? Um, so if you're not familiar with Designer, Designer's there now. This is um, the ability to dump a load of information on a PowerPoint page. I, I have used Designer quite regularly prior to Copilot anyway. Dump a load of information on the page, and then through Designer, it can give you options for layout. So, Copilot's created you your first draft of slides, but actually, do you use then Designer to kind of customize how it appears um, as, it, as you see it before you? Now, um, we've got it to create some slides. We've ended it on a conclusion. Um, one of the things that I want to do here um, is can you add a slide for this? Questions. Um, as with most presentations, at the end of it is potentially a thank you slide. It hasn't included that on um, on this particular occasion, so I wanted to add a slide about a specific um, circumstance. So it's added me a slide. Don't know why to put a picture of management in there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Presentation. That's one. Yeah. Um, it's a marketing plan. So we'll 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 remove that image because I don't like that image. Um, but we've now got our thank you slide. Um, what you do have the ability to do. Um, so let's say, can you add an image that um, represents questions? Um, 
So you have the ability to be able to add images. Now, at the moment, we have um, we have a we have a capability um, uh, called Microsoft Designer. Has anybody used Designer on the web? Where through um, natural language, you can get it to create an image for you. If you want an image of a hedgehog kicking a football, you can get an, an image of a hedgehog kicking a football. Microsoft Designer is a new capability using the DALI 3 technology. Designer is going to be coming into Word and PowerPoint. So if you say, for example, want a specific image that might not exist currently and you need to create it through natural language, you will be able to type in the type of image that you want to see. If it doesn't exist, it will create you an AI generated image. It doesn't exist currently, um, but that is a feature that's coming soon. But what this does is it calls on a bank of different images um, that you have access to. You can go into insert, you can go into uh, there's pictures, pictures um, from stock images, and there's a raft of different images in there you can use. What Copilot is doing is it's taking those click points out for you and going and finding an image relevant to the to the point that you put in. Conscious. image creation stuff. I've been using it for bedtime stories for little girls, and they'll just throw out ideas we can put into Copilot for the story, and then lo and behold, they'll go, oh, it's generated an image of that. So we had it once where it was a a boy that fed skittles to whales that made them change colour. So then I asked them to generate that picture and it came up with a little boy surrounded in a sea of skittles and there's two whales jumping through it. So yeah, that's sort of power in it again, just completely taken out. So it's a bit more but it's really good fun. Yeah, I mean, we talked about earlier that um, Copilot for Microsoft 365, although it's um, existed for just under a year now, um, it's continually evolving. There are updates coming through. On, I wouldn't say quite daily, but it's almost up. slowed down a lot. Yeah. I think more because we told them to. Yeah, it's, <laughs> um, every day is a bit much. There's Sorry. regular little updates coming through with regards to it. But that Dali 3, that ability to be able to get it to generate you an image, not just go and find you an image, generate you an image um, in the PowerPoint um, is there as well. Um, the final thing that I'll show is um, can you organize this presentation? Um, and while it's doing that, um, you'll see at the bottom here um, speaker notes. Um, so it's added speaker notes into the various different slides, either from the context that it's found in the Word document or context that is relevant. So it, there were no, there were no, um, there was nothing in the Word document about a thank you slide. So it's just added some notes if anybody needed it with regards to what you say at the end of the presentation. So I've asked it to organize the presentation because what it didn't have is it didn't have a structure into different sections. But now what it's done is it's built me out a structure that says we're going to have an introduction. Um, we've got the company and the marketing plan. Um, we've got marketing objectives. Um, we've got marketing strategies and then budget analysis and implementation ending with conclusion. So there's various different things that Copilot can help with creating presentations, summarizing presentations, organizing, adding the things uh, things to presentations that um, aren't necessarily already there. There's a there's a lot that can be done in Copilot in PowerPoint. With your prompting, I notice you're always asking it. Yeah, yeah. Does does it make any difference if you just tell it? You say, um, can you organize it? Yeah, yeah. You just say, <laughs> organize this. There's an internal uh, yeah. perception of this because yeah. there's nothing, no, no <coughs> real data that sits behind us being told to do that. Um, but it's AI and we don't know what it looks like on this slide, so we want to be very polite with it just in case. Yeah. Um, which which the product team find hilarious because obviously they, they can see our responses and see what's happening and make sure the data is good. Um, so they just keep sort of asking, why are you all being so polite? Just, Tell us to do so, so we can to the point that it says please and thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. you'll yeah. find out it's more people than, than you expect. Yeah. Um, but it definitely, I, th I find that it, 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 you get out of it what you put into it. If you have a more formal, more, more sort of blunt, um, sort of transactional, you will get a transactional response back. It's not a problem, but it probably has a nicer feel to it if it's a bit more personalised, a bit more. It's not like that's it's a bit to get into being nice to AI. Is it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We've seen some. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when Skynet eventually does get turned on, I'd rather be the one that goes, actually, I'm really nice yeah. to me yeah. for the last three yeah. years, but yeah. well, absolutely I was. I, 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 I think about Copilot as an actual <clears throat> person that can help me. And typically, when I ask people for help, I, I ask them, can they do something for me? Can they help me with something? Um, when, I, when I'm all these little idiosyncrasies that have popped up based on technology, 
Um, let's think about 10 years ago when you wanted to speak to somebody. What did you do? Did you text them before you called them or did you just call them? Whereas when you team somebody, how many people in the room send them a message to say you're free for two minutes for a chat? So many people will drop a message before they actually call somebody. It, it's not intentional the way in which people interact with technology. Sometimes it's maybe just natural. It feels like decorum mm -hmm. um, that I'm polite with the AI. Um, I, nobody's actually pointed out before, but it's actually, it's, yeah. Um, I've been asked before what will happen if I don't say please. And yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Does it ever refuse to launch the product team? I'll put something that says turn laptop off and yeah. you don't say please and thank you then. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe that's from more of a co pilot studio side of things. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious we've run over. Um, okay. there, there were two things I was going to um, going to show through. I was going to show through Excel and Microsoft 365 chat. What can we do? Do you want me to crack on? What, what does everybody want? Do you, do you want to, to say a little bit more or do you want to, to move on to another stage? We've got some non specific more. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. let's do a little bit more. Yeah. Because we can always short yeah. them, can't we? Okay. So, um, jumping in Excel. The first thing I'm going to point out about jumping into Excel, top right hand corner. It says preview. Excel is the only application that is still classified in preview. Um, it is slated for coming out of preview in the next month, um, according to the Microsoft 365 roadmap. Um, if I think about um, two different camps of people um, when I think about Excel, I think about um, uh, power users, um, and then I also think about power avoiders people that hear the word pivot table and run out that door, um, conditional formatting, and it gives them a sweat. Um, I'm, I'm, all right with, I'm all right with Excel. I'm quite good with Excel. Um, what I would say is I think we're more catering for the power avoiders at the moment than we are the power users. Capability with things like Python are slated to come further down the line. Um, the ability to be able to look up between different documents is something that I tried to originally get it to do. I've got some customer data over here and here, and I've got some customer data over here and here, and can I, can I reference those two data points? Struggled with it for me. Um, but there are some things that are definitely useful, and I, but as I say, I, the way in which I look at it, as I think at the moment what Copilot in Excel is doing is some rudimentary points that maybe helps those power avoiders more than does the power users. Um, now, one of the first things to, to point out is the data has to be presented in a table has to be presented in a table format. So you can see here on the right hand side, I've got my Copilot pane open. I did that um, earlier by clicking the Copilot button. Um, and what it said is, um, once this data is in a table, I can start helping you with it. If I click into a blank space, it says I only work in an Excel table and it can't actually see any information that looks as if it should be in a table. Because I've clicked into this information, it's recognized there's a bunch of info here. Maybe I should, con uh, I should convert A1 to H61 into a table for you. Do you want me to do that for you? Yes, I do. Let's convert it into a table. Um, now, I've got all of that raw data. I'm going to control Z that, hopefully. Um, I want to go back into raw. This is the same data in that table. Um, now, here what I've, um, what I've got is I've got information relating to sales. So various different countries, various different customers. Um, product information, whether there was discount applied, units sold, various different data points. Now, in this particular point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get it to think about showing me some data insights. Um, so that's a prompt that is already generated um, or, or an option that's there. It will go across and it will reason over that data and it will show you a data insight relating to the, to the information in that table. Um, so here what we've got is sale price by date. Um, it's just finishing up at the moment. It says it's a pivot chart that's created to show the sale price um, by date. For example, in May 2021, the sale price was 19,638. 19, and in June, it was 57,600. Is there anything else that you would want to know? It's not telling you the reason behind why that happened, but it potentially poses the question, why have we seen such a rise in the sale price in that period of time? That's the question that I need to go away and answer. Now, I've got the ability to be able to add this to a new sheet, um, or I can say, can, you, can I see another insight, or can I add all insights to grid? Now, I'm going to add all insights to the grid in the interest of time. Um, and what it will do is it will go through repeating that exercise, I think, on six or seven different occasions. I um, mean, it will start with adding those insights into a pivot table, creating a graph based on that pivot table. So here I can see that 
Um, the units sold by country, France are actually top of the charts. Um, if that's not information I was able to delineate from that Excel table originally, it's helped me to, to view that now. Again, information that I could potentially take and put into an internal presentation um, or pop into an email to go and pose the question, right, France, why are you doing so well? Help me to understand this. Um, we're, when we're using the discount band medium, we've got a noticeably higher sale price, so although we're, we're actually giving more discount than low, actually we've got a relatively good sale price on that. Um, so we need, to, we need to make sure that we've got good stock of that product within that particular realm. It gives you these data insights. So as I say, democratizing capability in Excel so that an individual that's not familiar with PowerPoints, not great with power, uh, pivots, not great with graphs, and just go into some raw data. If it's not in a table, get it put into a table. When it's in the table, ask it to show me some insights. What should I be looking at here? Now, the other sorts of things that we can um, look to think about getting it to do for us um, are to alter data that already exists um, or add some more information based on data that already exists. So here what we've got is we've got a bike inventory. So we've got a product ID, the model type, what category it falls in, the price, uh, production costs, various different attributes relating to those bikes, um, including stock levels. Um, so I've clicked into the table so I can engage with Copilot. Can you add me a column that tells me the profit margin? Um, so at the minute, I understand that I've got a production cost in there, I've got a sale cost in there. Uh, we've got an RRP as well, but what I don't have is, are my bikes profitable? Are these particular models profitable? Um, and again, while I've, I'm fairly confident I'd be able to insert a column and put in the formula I would need in order to, to pull out that um, particular insight, there might be some people that would struggle with that and they end up pinging somebody else to say, right, what's the profit margins on these? Um, taking up somebody else's time as well. But Copilot here, um, is said, right, this is what the formula is. It needs to be the current price minus the production cost divided by the current price. It will explain the formula and you can just hover over insert column and it will ghost it in. When you hit insert column, it will add that column in. Um, so initially, um, what I've also noticed here is I've got some negative profit margins. That's not good. Um, that's a little bit of a worry. Um, so here I'm going to ask it a question, can you highlight any profit margins in uh, that 10%, let's say, in red. Um, so I'm going to ask it, um, for those that might be able to see at the back, can you highlight any profit margins that are below 10% in red? One of the things, again, that I've picked up with um, is what the columns are described as at the top when you engage with Copilot. Think about what the columns are described as when you're asking it a question relating to that column. Just helps with the response that it provides. So here, done, I've made the following changes. I applied a red fill color and a black font to the, um, to the color of the column's profit margin where the sales value was lower than 10%. So actually, the reason I did that is because I've got a long list of different bikes and products and models, but now I can quite clearly see which are the products that are not profitable, um, quite simply. Does anybody know what it is that it's called that did that? Conditional formatting? Yeah, conditional formatting. I didn't ask it to do conditional formatting. I didn't ask it to implement conditional formatting. You don't need to know the language that exists in Excel, what the feature is called. Through natural language, I've asked it to make the cell red if it's less than 10%. It is applied conditional formatting because that's what it is that it needs to do. Um, the other thing that I'll ask it here, we've got a problem with profit margins. Um, so one of the things I could look at is reducing my production costs. There'd be a bunch of different things that we need to do, but um, what happens um, to profit margins if we reduce <coughs> production costs? By 10%. Chris, just a, a question just on the previous thing. If you were to make a change to, say, a sell price and it, uh, sorry, it, as uh, production costs went up, would it retrospectively find any that had gone below 10% as well? Would you have to run that prompt again? No, yeah, so conditional formatting, because what we've done is we've not just placed a, a red color on it, because I could clear conditional formatting from that column in a moment. But that is now said. 
if at any point in time that cell there drops below 10 percent make it red any any of those cells make them red cool. so, so, so what it references there that the formula that it uses it actually applies that to the cell and then it applies conditional formatting on top of the cell or the cell or the whole table to map that back to what you've asked so yeah very much through that natural language you've also then got the how and then you can go and explain that to someone i think sometimes yeah. one thing that we, we sometimes miss as well is how have you got that yeah. <laughs> what formula did you put together and it obviously gives it you as part of that prompt so if you want to just understand what's making this data set now so you can actually then go and verbalize it someone present on it or articulate it rather than just go and look at this it's nice Basically, it's all red right. <laughs> basically turned into danny from my finance team oh yeah 100 now danny's gonna get yeah, danny. not as annoying yeah, when you come over what's that thing you do every, every, every month you do this thing that makes the cell go red yeah. can you just do it again he's like sorry i'll just do it myself i tried to copy and paste the one from the paper and it didn't work then. yeah uh, can, can you say uh, insert the seed of all the UK sales or something? Can I? Like, I want to insert the seed to include all the UK sales, all the information. Oh, so you want to separate the UK sales out from, so in that, so in this customer data that was here, we want to separate the customer sales yeah. from the UK. Yes, you can um, just fill, just uh, I, again I you, can using the tools filter, in there, right? it would filter based, yeah, on, based filter on the relevance it. of the country within the data set, and then it would just bring through all the right data, as if you would manually go through and filter that anyway, but it will understand the content of the, the rows and columns that are associated. Yeah. And um, now the question I asked it here is, what happens if profit margins um, if we reduce production uh, production costs by ten percent? Again, it tells me what the formula is that it expects to use. Um, and explains what that formula looks like. And again, I've got the ability to be able to ghost it in, um, or I can add that in so that I can now see that profit margin with reduced cost, um, those particular bytes will actually start to make um, more profit margins. Um, as I say, the, the ability in Excel at the moment, I, I, I consider to be kind of foundational. Um, there are definitely things that um, it's, it's useful for, um, but there are, if you have got a power user that's using Python in Excel um, and they've created doc, um, they've created Excel workbooks that are connected between various different workbooks using XLOOKUP and all those different <laughs> capabilities, their, their experience in Excel I don't necessarily will be the same as what it would in all the other applications. Um, but there definitely are there definitely are reasons as to why Excel can support a number of users in the business. But at the moment, it's still in preview, which is which is what I like to clarify. Just hold on to bear with us. Yeah. Can we do the data inside in Power BI using Copilot? Sorry. Can we do the data inside in Power BI using Copilot? Yeah. So, so that's an, another another feature to reference. To be fair, and um, so obviously because Power Platform has its own Copilot as well, and um, if Power Platform's got access to the to the data sets, it can reference that and bring it in. And then when we finally uh, release the full integration across all of them, then you'd be able to essentially do it from, from both sides to say you know, the, the report that was the dashboard you've created here, can you present that back into one of these to, in one of these sheets um, and vice versa. But yeah, it's definitely something you can already do from the outcome oh, perspective. So the very final one, um, this is on my live environment, so I'm going to ask it one question and I'm not going to ask it any more questions to make sure it doesn't get something back. <laughs> no, I've already spotted, I've got some digital debt. I've got 35 Teams messages and 12 notifications. Um, but some of the things that you can think about getting Copilot to help with in Copilot, uh, Microsoft 365 chat, um, what's new? So it can scan across your messages and your emails, your Teams messages, your emails, and reason over data across multiple different areas. Um, get key information, draft an FAQ, help me write something. Um, you can view um, prompts. Copilot Labs is not something that I've talked about yet, but Copilot Labs or Copilot for Microsoft 365 customers get access to it. It is then organization specific sharing. So if people in your business want to share what prompts they've been using, they can share it in Copilot Labs. But there are also suggestions in there to how you can think about engaging in PowerPoint, Excel, Word to help drive adoption. But I can view what are some of the prompts that I can think about um, using. Now, um, I'm going to ask it a question, a broad question. What are some of the benefits to working for Microsoft in the UK? Um, hopefully it comes back with good things. Microsoft um, in, the, in, the, in the UK. 
Um, and the reason I put in the UK is actually, I actually had a question. I was curious about some of the benefits um, the other day. I, was, I thought I remembered some benefits, so I asked the Microsoft 365 chat to go and find some information. What it ended up pulling back was information relating to the US, so I, I was a bit more specific and I asked it a, a question relating to the UK. But what we found here is it has pointed me towards a well-being website, um, a working from Microsoft SharePoint, and um, a kickstart interview on the perks and benefits of working at Microsoft. So if you've got new people that are joining the business and they've got questions on what are some of the benefits of working for the business, the first thing they might do is speak to their buddy, they might speak to HR, but actually they could potentially use Copilot for Microsoft 365. Think about it more broadly. Uh, the other day, I was, um, I've been building a Power application um, with a colleague internally, and we've built it in the dev environment, and I said, right, okay, I think we need to now move it to a production environment. Do you know how to do that? And she was like, I've got no clue how to do that. So the first thought was, do we need to raise that with IT? I could do some web searches. I asked Microsoft 365 chat, how do I internally create a production environment um, for Power Applications. And it gave me a small paragraph, provided me a link to the form that I needed to fill in. Um, within five minutes, I filled that form in, and within 24 hours, I had my produ production environment authorized. I probably would have still been waiting for IT to respond, um, and they, they may or may not have pointed me in that direction. So it reasons over the organization's data, um, whether it's something that you're trying to bounce an idea off Copilot, or you just need to know where do I go and find this information. If it exists, if they have access to it, if they have the permissions to have access to it, Copilot can help surface it. But that was Copilot in a raft of different applications. Um, as I say, whether it's sales, marketing, <coughs> finance, HR, so many different reasons why why individuals I think would would use it based on their role. It's about just determining what are those individuals doing in their job, and how much value will they get out of it. Because what I do in sales is different to what somebody else does in sales because I don't need to create PowerPoints. Because actually, if a salesperson in your organization needs to create PowerPoints, then that particular capability in PowerPoint might be useful. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was useful. So, folks, I'm not sure how I follow that, if I'm honest. The live demo of Copilot, brave a man than I am. Um, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about how better to support your co-pilot journey, what we've got to offer in this space. Um, so we think adoption is a journey within co-pilot. Um, clearly, it's an incredibly powerful and evolving tool um, that's really going to change the way that we all go about our daily business, perhaps in ways we can't yet understand. Um, and we think there's a number of different stages as we start to look at that. So we can look at this as a journey, you know, understanding what is possible with co-pilot, We've spent some good time on that today. Um, assess how can we use it within our businesses. So taking that away, thinking about how we're going to actually deliver that. There's a process of understanding already in this uh, uh, to, to embrace this product. We can certainly help you around that. I'll talk a little bit about some of the offers we've got there. Um, the licensing element of it, making sure you've got the right licenses and buying that in the most cost effective manner possible. And how do we go about deploying that? delivering a proof of concept and ultimately going live. So we see it very much as a, a, as a journey. It's not a, I buy a license, I turn it on and away I go, my business has changed. Certainly there's more to it than just, just that. And on that journey, we've got a number of things that we can help you here at Beck Club with. So you mentioned the Microsoft assessments, uh, being able to uh, understand where you happen to be in terms of your security and your readiness around Copilot. Um, that's a free of charge service we've got coming to see um, and uh, so now launched. now launched there you go so it's even more up to date than that so now launched. Speak coming, to, now. coming now you can speak to your uh, account manager speak to the software team and we'll get you on that journey to understand how ready your environment is for co-pilot we then have perhaps more tailored more engaged uh, uh, more engaging ways of, uh, of looking at we have co-pilot readiness assessment workshops with first security um, and that's a partner of ours that understand how Copilot works, how it can be applied, and they will spend time over the course of the day understanding your business, how it might best be applied. And then we have our own Copilot workshop, which is a free day engagement. It's typically, it's a paid for engagement. However, that's potentially eligible for funding from Microsoft. That takes you through 
understanding that readiness element, but then going on to the ask the possible so a similar, if not quite so live, thank you for setting the bar so high for us, <laughs> um, a demonstration to your teams, to your key stakeholders in your business. So this understanding you have gained during the course of day of what the tool is capable of, what the product can deliver is understood across the board, or at least in a much larger group. So when we then go into that set, that final stage of building that plan, how do I gain this adoption? How do I go through a proof of concept? How do I measure that? We can bring in, that's a workshop bit exercise where we bring in those people that experience the art of the possible to start saying, right, what does this look like within your organization? Who do we apply it to? What controls, what training do we need? How are we measuring that? And help build that plan to get for you. We have following up from this event, we have a, uh, a safer date. We've got a follow up webinar where we're going to cover a little bit more co pilot in action, not quite the live demo, but stories from and experiences from those that we've got who are going through co pilot uh, proof of concepts and adopting it already. We're going to uh, speak a little bit about the roadmap, what we know about what's coming. I'm going to twist some arms there from some of the people in the room here. Um, an overview of what we're seeing in the wider generative AI market as well. So a little bit more detailed understanding of where there's custom versions of Copilot, custom AI tools and what's, what's being used and a little bit more of a, an open panel and discussion. That's a much shorter event, but please do put that in your diaries, register for that, and then we'll build a little bit on the knowledge we've gained today. <coughs> and then finally, we have an offer. So if you haven't already purchased Microsoft Copilot, if you purchase 50 or more Copilot licenses on an annual commit for the CSP program, um, you will receive a £250 professional services voucher to go towards one of our Beckler Copilot workshops, be that the larger three-day engagement or the first security, the one-day engagement that you can use to, to help advance that process. And I think 50 users is a nice size for a proof of concept, 300, I, I think your, your customer is probably right. It's a little bit sizable, yeah. 300 <laughs> users, <laughs> but certainly 50 is a common common starting point within organisations. And that's really how we can help you with that journey. We're going to shut now. Unless there's any particular questions on anything up front there? Brilliant. So, Andy's going to step forward. I've, my name's up here, but my job is to uh, to to be Debbie McGee to uh, Paul Daniels' uh, <laughs> show showcase. Um, so, so as we spoke about uh, again so far, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, very consistent questions or concerns um, with people acknowledging potential risks. Um, and like we've spoken about, to be fair, which will help me with a lot of the slides because um, uh, we're not starting from scratch with them. But these are the types of things that we're coming up against that we, we were very much preparing partners on and the types of questions that we're getting from, from customers as part of the preview or customers and partners <coughs> since GA. Um, and it's really just about adoption and education of their users and their organisations. And um, we're really starting to have a narrative much more closer to the, the cultural shift within organisations, which probably might not have even been considered. I know I probably didn't speak on it at all uh, for the last six months. Um, and now it's all we, we really speak about. But really grounding it in, in what's required of you, your organisation, any expectations from security and compliance perspective, but then also the impact on who's doing what within what co-pilot, within which experience, within which application, when, where, how, and really asking the questions um, before using the product. Um, we've got a lot of guidance and a lot of advice uh, from some of the sites that we'll mention in this section and the ones that Chris mentioned before, um, around really how to get started to those um, so user groups within the organisation, earmarking who those champions of Copilot are going to be, at least to give you uh, an opportunity to discuss where the potential value sits within your organisation. And um, really around the digital product aspect or trying to find that productive value, if there's not an opportunity or a use case for Copilot to be attached to them, then there's no Copilot conversation. That's not a negative. That's a good thing. If it is something that's completely efficient or completely non-adaptable, it's just a linear process. It just is. Sometimes there's not going to be those ability to have AI attached to it, but there will be another aspect. So one thing I always encourage uh, partners to do with customers is to walk for almost the, the day in the life of those roles that are a bit adverse to change or ones that are a bit too excited. Maybe ground them in the realization of 
when you come in and you see your emails, you see your calls, you're walking through this process, you do this operational task, where can and where can't AI really apply there? Or is there actually another logical process that sits in? Is that a bit of automation or some sort of data processing? It's not co-pilot related, but you're very excited by what, what currently offer it. So it's always good just to ground those uh, in these types of uh, questions and feedback we're hearing. Um, we're going to show a bit of a video, which hopefully the sound come through one. I know it's been a, probably a very top of mind aspect around how does it, how does Copilot integrate really with the data security that exists, and you know, where, how does it actually respect the permissions and access? And so, hopefully, I'll show you a little bit. About this. Microsoft Copilot for Microsoft 365 works with the data security controls you have in place for file access, labeling, classification, and data loss prevention. Mario Rogers works for Violet Martinez and both are in the same team at Kintoso. Mario and Violet are also members in the same group working on Project Falcon. Now we'll start with Violet, who's been working with the procurement and contract management teams to sell their partner, Relicloud, 1500 market quadcopters. And you can see this file is labeled highly confidential with restricted access, and it describes all the terms in the purchase agreement. Because Violet has access to the file, she's able to search for and find it in SharePoint and Microsoft365.com. And of course, Violet can also navigate to the file's location in the Agreements folder of the project site to find the purchase agreement. Okay, now let's switch over to Mario's experience. Even though he's on the same team and working on Project Falcon with Violet, if Mario tries to search for the Contoso purchase agreement, he won't find it. And there are a few purchasing agreements that he does find without sensitive information, but not the one that Violet is working on. And if Mario knows the location of the purchase agreement and tries to navigate to it directly, it just appears as an empty folder to him. And when Mario launches Word on the web and creates a blank document, then prompts Copilot for Microsoft 365 to summarize the Contoso purchase agreement as a reference file, because Copilot for Microsoft 365 respects the file permissions of its user, it cannot access the purchase agreement. Now if we switch back to Violet's screen, because she has permissions to access the purchase agreement, she can use Copilot for Microsoft 365 to summarize the file. And after a moment, you'll see it created a summary of the purchase agreement, and Violet decides to keep it. Then, data security controls from Microsoft Purview discover sensitive information found in Copilot for Microsoft 365 generated content. The document is automatically labeled as highly confidential and policies are enforced to restrict access to the document. Additionally, when Copilot for Microsoft 365 retrieves and uses sensitive files that a user has permission to access, it will display the sensitivity label to the user in its response and under references. And if a Copilot user references a file already with a sensitivity label applied in their prompt, the response generated by Copilot for Microsoft 365 will automatically inherit the sensitivity label from the referenced file. Finally, all user interactions with Copilot for Microsoft 365 are logged and can be discovered like other Microsoft 365 activities and information using the Microsoft Purview Compliance Portal. That covers very quickly in a more articulated way than I could have, and um, acknowledging the risk factors around who can access what, how can I find it, is there a potential concern about someone's account being compromised, and then what they can access, get access to within the organization. And that's no different than the concerns today if that was to happen, but at least it gives you a good visualization as to what that would look like from a co pilot experience, but then also how that resonates back to the non co pilot experience, the actual SharePoint location. And um, so really, as, as a summary of that, that data flow, it's very much about understanding where the, the documents or the information is stored and how the, the membership or the permission structure is, is being rolled up or rolled down. And then what data classification has been applied to that, what information protection has been enabled. And then also understanding from a purview perspective, what features are available for you there from a, a general auditing purpose, but also then for any compliance and things you need to adhere to this is where you would then be able to, to reference back to actually understand what's happening and ensure that there is a good <clears throat> quality of compliance happening within your organizations. And so we're just going to touch a little bit on that auditing process because 
I don't know if anyone's actually seen this. Uh, I've definitely not presented on it uh, externally, but it's it's really just about a lot of those familiar questions that come up about where is this, where does it, where is it seen, where is it found, how is it referenced, and really it's within um, the purview, um, and you'll see here as part of the sorry I can't see it, um, as part of the metadata. Um, so maybe just a step back. One thing we we didn't touch on necessarily in the build up to Copilot going live was the the transaction, uh, and maybe the transparency was very much your chat isn't saved, the experience isn't, isn't relayed back into the model, very much every new conversation is a new Copilot experience. From a user perspective, that's absolutely grounded in pure truth. From an organizational perspective, it's your data, it's your tenancy, it's not Microsoft's, it's not anyone else's. We can't tell you that your uh, engineers can now go and search and try and find out everyone's pay uh, or try and get some HR documents and you never know about that from an organizational perspective that's happening in your office it's happening on your ground floor you need to have visibility and insight into interrogating that qualifying it validating it more than anything um, and that's where it's going to be, be possible within within purview through the discovery and audit tools so this is the type of data that you'll get as to in reference to what information was accessed in which application and um, at what times referencing the user ids what uh, ip it's coming uh, come from and then obviously referencing this through a profile experience as well so this you can disseminate between different audit logs and different file access methods <coughs> which one specific to copilot as well so from an audit perspective make it quite easy to find as well and um, another angle that comes up is definitely around uh, privacy and um, which really then leans a bit on the, the data residency and the concern as to where my data is right now where can it go how can it be accessed how is it secured Copilot doesn't change any of that mechanism that still falls under the, the groundwork that's been laid by M365, by the tenancy policies, by the really the legalities that we've already committed to as part of that process and, and really our adoptions Copilot doesn't change any of those from a fundamental perspective. They actually adhere to it explicitly. So depending on where your data is stored, where you allow it to be, where you allow it to be compliant or not compliant or where your sovereignty or governance needs to sit. It's completely within your control. It follows all of those M365 tenancy uh, governance and compliance agreements with Microsoft. So there's no changes explicitly with that from a from an AI perspective or from a copilot perspective. But then also it still falls under the same sort of security methodologies as your data would do today. So just because you've enabled um, copilot on the web or in Chakra um, or copilot within M365 doesn't now mean you need to go back and change anything for that purpose, you would really be doing that before you turn Copilot on and make sure your file structure and your organizational structure is in the best place it should be. But it's then validating that the level of security is exactly the same as what you've got before turning Copilot on as you've got after turning Copilot on. So I'm going to touch, um, which to be fair, we probably covered uh, massively throughout with all the, the amazing questions. We'll give you a little bit of a visualization as to how the, the prompt works and, and really how it's grounded in, in that process and um, so see so step one being that the, the user would prompt as part of that, that co-pilot experience there's a process there called pre-processing where it essentially gets the rationale of the the response based on the existing grounded data so what you've got already as part of your graph within your organization what it maybe has already uh, had some experience with it then references a uh, the internet for any qualification, but also then any plugins, um, as, as Becky mentioned before, to see if there's something that you are purposely wanting to integrate <coughs> into or something that we've already had uh, uh, configured as a plugin that you've enabled. It then has the option then as part of the graph to then reference alternatives or other data sources within the Microsoft tenancy where you may have data stored as well. So it's not the full scope of all Microsoft services and capabilities, but definitely from a database and a, a power platform perspective, because you'll have a lot of data inspiration there as well. Following that, it then sends those prompts through to the large language model. So it's sort of <coughs> not the grounding of that data, just to see sort of a bit of contextualization, or basically it's going to break it down into chunks. And there's a really good depth that's really technical and way bigger than mine. And it goes exactly into how those prompts are uh, processed from a metadata level, how it will take sort of each keyword, remove any fluff, anything that's just relevant for conversation, but not for how the data is uh, interrogated. And that's what it uses then to match against the model just to qualify the specific key information that it's trying to find, so keywords, anything that it can attach any relevance to. So, okay, this is a person's name, this is an object, this is an item, this is a place. 
and then it will uh, run that through that process to make sure basically that it can start to pull together an actual formulated response as opposed to just saying keyword, key object, keyword, key object. It's not uh, too linear then. Next, it will go back to the graph. So it will then reference back to your user area and um, based off the, the processing that's then been done from the large language model. And it's basically just a, another validation technique to make sure that a, it's still relevant to what you've asked for, the original prompt and what it's been grounded on and just almost just double checking. Um, but that's where it then adds that flavor of personalization as to whether you've added on your please and thank yous or you've added in a certain context that it now needs to apply after it's done almost its keyword um, processing. And then it does the pro, uh, post processing. So that's the area then just to make sure that from a, a compliance purview, respecting that, that um, document protection, that that's then applied. So it's almost like the first thing that's checked in regards to what you've got access to. And then it's the last thing that's checked just to make sure that anything that has been referenced or uh, created or pulled from another document, it then does that final compliance check just to say, actually, this is sensitive, this is confidential, I now need to apply that as well, and then give you the response. Or if you're creating something new, that's when it will then pull in those citations and add them as long well as part of the response. And um, just so it, it's ticked off and then all the made, their metadata is then created. And then it will present that response back to you as a user. So in what really is part of the experience is quite a simple and almost transactional feel. It's quite complex and there's a few other slides that go into it in a lot more detail and really goes into that, that full process. And it's an absolute mess of a slide, um, which is why I didn't include it. But this one gives you a good flavour and a good feel to exactly what's happening behind the scenes, at what point, at what part, and then what the expectation is when it does return to you. So if there's ever an experience where you've referenced something that is labelled as confidential, by the time it's come back for you, you want to pull some of that data in and it's not applied and respected that, immediately that's a problem. That would never happen, touch wood. But if it did, you would you would understand that that should have been that final check in that before it gave you that response, that should have been applied, whether that be a conflict of, of data that's happened there or something that's a problem with, with the actual prompt and it's a quick thumbs down straight into our product team and engineering, which they'll be all over. Um, but that thankfully hasn't happened in GA as far as I've seen. And you've got the uh, responsible AI checks there as well in that yes. process. So that's where Copilot and uh, the large language model are checking to make sure that what you're asking the system to do is um, uh, ethical uh, and responsible. So if we ask it to plan world domination and create bomb making instructions for us, it will flag there and prevent that abuse there. So making sure that we're acting in a responsible way. <coughs> what traceability? <coughs> In, so you can like breadcrumbs. So see if somebody three three people have access to a file or a folder, then somebody accesses it. Can I see who accessed it? Can it tell me who accessed it? When? What they changed? Maybe in a file? Uh, if I guess from an accountability person, yes, because if you're both members of a group that have access and the right permissions to a folder, for example, if you were to go on to um, <coughs> the M365 website like now or onto SharePoint, yeah. and you can see the transaction yeah. view of what's happened, it will reference that and say, oh, I can see that this file that I've got access to, and I can see what's happening because it's a almost like a multi-membership um, file or folder, it's only going to reference the same information that you can see. So it will be able to say, yeah, this was changed at this time, and maybe, you know, especially because it's an organizational level, it can pull through that personal ident identifiable information because it's the organization's data. I wouldn't be able to do that to, to query. If you'd send me that document, it wouldn't tell me you've changed it. Sure. Someone else within your organization <coughs> has changed it. Yeah, because that's same, the same audit tracking. And then as well, it's important to understand that this is Copilot for Act. You see in the live demo, every prompt, keep it. Do you want to use it? This is the reference. So it's not changing your underlying data without, mm -hmm. without user interaction as well. So, you so, so very much then if you were to create something new or and reference it or say, okay, I want to go into the open up this document, I want to change these things, that wouldn't um, track it in any other kind of way. It would do exactly the same as if you were to do that today outside of Copilot. And um, which I think is quite good then when you get to the citation portion of it. And whether you're sort of in the, the prompt or just referencing back to a file, um, I've already had some sort of audit and compliance people come. This is absolute goal because now I don't have to walk around the office saying, right, you changed this. You just put it here and then you can find out, but it's 
probably easier to walk around and ask who did it. Whereas now you can sort of go in, immediately check that citation and go, and know who did it and when and where this is coming from. They've just pulled it from the wrong document. There's a lot of accountability that can be applied there, but for the, for the qualification. I think it's important then from this side, which is a much simpler version of understanding that sort of spider web. And as we sort of described earlier from semantic index, the, the easiest way to describe it is, is almost like neural pathways. So those are those uh, sort of key core sort of memories within your brain as to what becomes familiar, what becomes sort of muscle memory. Muscle memory is a neural pathway. And that's how it gets more familiar with your activity, who you're engaging with, what applications you're engaging with. But then also it then gives you a better understanding of, well, actually, if I don't index this folder, well, semantic index doesn't have access to it. And if I don't give people permission to it, they don't have access to it. And it's a simple concept, but applied in almost to rationalize the complexity of what they can do and where. Uh, and like I said earlier as well, um, at some point, <laughs> we'll fully enable the integration in between those modules as well. So whereas there's the M365 chat as an overarching experience, and then the Copilot experience within those applications to respectfully sort of be in that place of work, then we'll be updating it uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> I'm, I need it, and um, to be able to then be a bit more flexible with, with taking that experience almost along the journey as well. So Copilot uh, M365 chat now is amazing at it because you can start there, get that good sort of grounding as to where I need to lift off from and you reference to those applications, but it's not going to then take you to that application. Whereas if I want to have I don't know, a list of all my unread emails after a week on holiday <laughs> and I want that to go into a loop table with you know, who the, the senders were, what days they responded to, prioritised by uh, I don't know, sensitivity or, or based on how urgent they put it down. Is, it will give you that prompt, it will give you that response, but it won't then take you to loop and do a component and add that in for you, whereas that's something that's definitely coming and, and will be there soon. Um, but just want to stop on this one to see if anyone's got any questions on it or anything that you want to just clarify. What, what changes are coming down the pipe? You said there's lots of changes. Lots of things, um, I'll send you the link. <laughs> um, there's probably too many to mention. Um, I think from an integration perspective, it's it's exactly that, making it as integrated as we possibly can do. And um, we're actually <coughs> working with third parties on new plugins for uh, for Teams, for is example. Is the engine itself staying any static, or is that changing? Um, uh, so it's uh, slightly separate. So, so in, in do you mean from the LLM? Language. Yeah, so that will that will continue. <laughs> so um, it's probably a really good touch point. So in regards to obviously the chat GPT model being open and basically constantly live, and um, we have a stop date almost. It's not necessarily a particular date, but we have a point in time where we'll sort of carve that off. And then it's qualified. OpenAI have a really robust, compliant, auditable process as to how they do it. They use a lot of third parties to basically run and, and basically comb through all that data. We do it ourselves once it's on our side, just to validate it and make sure we've got our seal of approval. And, and sort of at that point, it's already locked down. That data doesn't change. And that's what we start to then move through our development pipelines as well. Does so it will be separate into each tenant to what all the tenants using the same version? It will always reference back. So this, there'll probably be multiple large language models, but you'll always be using the same version. Probably more from a functionality perspective, there's not just one static one sat there because we'll DDoS ourselves, um, but very much so it, it, it's processing power isn't in, 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 impacted by it, but very much so there's consistency across the board, absolutely, which is why uh, I guess there's some people have asked, um, maybe some of the experiences don't always feel like they're using GPT-4, and it's because of that grounding, is, it's grounding off the same subset of data within the LLM, because that model isn't changing and maturing, as ChatGPT does, then that's why it almost Default back to that experience. And are, are there any intentions from Microsoft to actually let it dig yeah. into the data you've got? Because I know you most of worry about security. Absolutely. I'd like you to learn from the um, data. You've got thing. Copilot Studio. <laughs> if you want to you build your own Copilot and have that experience, we'll always be really consistent in that response to say the model you begin with is one that we absolutely have to put our stop it feels price on. You always start with a blank sheet each time you're setting your questions. Like it's, and that's it's why I think it's then key for us to make sure that we're, we're not just leaving that there forever. That has to continuously update. We have to constantly get new and updated models that are qualified, but it's the, the reassurance that to always learn from our, our data. Exactly. So it's always that side of we need to make sure that you've got, you can't have the whole, the old chat GPT experience of this is not in before September 2021 because it's not going to be helpful in day to day life when you're referencing. Uh, you know, a statement of work from yesterday, but the technology from three years ago is not not going to make any sense. So we'll almost commit to making sure that the models as up to date as we can rationally keep it, but 
it has to also then be compliant to be able to use the latest uh, GPT functions as well. So the data can't be too far out, otherwise it's not going to work for GPT as well. And the idea is that we keep it as close to GPT sort of functionality as well. It's interesting because my experience, having had Copilot now since I think the end of November to today, the product that I use in Interact today is significantly better experience, significantly um, uh, more fluid and, and better at uh, what it's, uh, I'm asking to the, deliver <laughs> than it was the day I first had it. Now, there'll be an element of that, whereas I've got a bit better at prompting it, understanding what it's good at, how I can redirect it. But certainly, you, you can see it improve over the course of months as you go through in terms of the quality of the output yeah. you get. It's probably a really good um, point of reference because I've, I've recently got the answer for this question. Um, in the adoption period, once you get assigned a license and it's activated, how long is it? How long before you start to get that more personalised feel, it starts to understand and get a bit of of how you work? The feedback that came out of the, the preview and what we're starting to get from customers and partners now, um, we're typically seeing it's around two to three months. Uh, quicker, if you're a sort of fast adopter and you're like some product managers are absolutely a, using the system and um, by getting it to just constantly be bombarded with things whereas if you're more a casual user and you're trying to break down some muscle memory and, and figure out where it can apply two to three months so i guess as chris mentioned before because it is just a normal license skew it can be unassigned and assigned within m365 admin and that sort of process then is almost part to the pre-copilot conversation if you're looking at your sort of employee base and qualifying who those copilot champions could be you actually could potentially earmark four users per license, but it's whether you then see value being had within a three month period of the production period, but then also then operationalizing it and really giving it that relevance. Some some customers I've seen them pass it around the business like, like it's anything and get tangible, valuable results that they've sort of tasked people with having it all done by a set date so everyone's sort of got a bit of a touch point what they had to allow for that period of adoption time. And some users that was longer, some users that was shorter. So it's definitely a consideration, but something that as part of the license purchases or license conversations with customers, it's a good thing to note to say, yes, you can move it, but what's the value that you're expecting to see or want to see from that? Because if you give it someone for two weeks, you're not going to see maybe as much value as you give them for two months or six months or for the whole year of the license term. So. It's a really good point. It's a good gauge. Yeah, it's a really good point. And again, just echoing back my experience over the last course of those months, the first time you get that license and you get that capability, you probably spend the first two weeks going, okay, does it, does it do that? You know, can I make it do what it did in the video? Um, and, and so you do that initial period, but then it's how it seeps into what you do every day. As you start to use the, um, the, the product and you get more advantage of it as you get used to using it and you start to think about, oh, I can get Copilot to do that. I was, I was saying to the, the guys before the session um, yesterday evening. I'd come away from a um, uh, come away from from work and had my day, and I'm sat in the pub. I had my, my pint of beer, so I had my phone with me, and I had a message to think with one of our AMs that I know. We'd been on a couple of calls. The client had a big uh, project that they wanted us to engage with, and we needed to respond in an email to explain. Look, the project's so big. We need to do this. These are the stages we need to go through. And these are the considerations. And I go, oh, I was going to give him that email, I was going to give him that draft. Now all I'm there is with my phone. Now, in the past, I've got to have to wait till tomorrow or when I get home and maybe if I haven't had more than one or two, I might, might draft it. Um, but I was able to actually put it into Copilot on Outlook there. Could you draft me an email? Briefly describe the, um, the scenario. It's the tone of the email that I wanted. And it generated me a draft, which was over review and go, oh, that's it, that's spot on and sending it there. Now, I wouldn't have thought to use it in that way on day one of being uh, of given. So it takes that time um, to really get to grips with it, I think. Yeah, there, there, isn't, there isn't a week that goes by that I don't learn something new that Copilot is capable of doing. And it might just only be little things, but one of, the, one of the things we do internally is we kind of map count. So when we engage with customers, what have they got at the moment, how can we help them? Um, I use the domain of a customer's website in order to, to view the customer. Normally that's go on to Bing, not Google, go on to Bing, search each customer name, take the domain, paste it into Excel, put it into a location. The other day I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to give this list of customers to Copilot and ask it whether it can map the domain um, from the web uh, to, that, to that customer list. Um, I learned that when I gave it 30 customers, it could do 10. 
When I gave it 10, it could do 10. When I gave it 10, it could do 5. 5 was the sweet spot where you got it right every single time. Um, another thing that I learned with TJ Devine put on LinkedIn, um, I asked Copilot uh, Microsoft 365 chat, how am I spending my time next week? Categorize it into five to seven different ways and tell it what percentage of time I'm spending on those different five to seven categories. And came back with a categorization of how they're spending their time internally, externally, what percentage they're spending in it. Am I investing the time that I have in my day in the areas that are most productive of me? I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily think about asking Microsoft 365 chat to, to do that in that way. There's just so many different things that people are using it for that will only happen as people start to engage with it. Does it happen on day one? Some of it will, but not all of it will. The rest of it will flow as they just start testing it, pushing in. Well, this is a good idea. Can it do this? And the bits where they find, yes, it can, that's where the, 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 the productivity savings will come in. We had a table of my five best, biggest suppliers yeah. and their financial year end and quarter end because that might influence the conversations I have in procurement with them. You know, I'd have to manually go and get that data so at that table. I always give the odd, odd one out here from an outlook perspective. I really like writing a good email, so I rarely use the draft. But using the <coughs> using the uh, coaching has absolutely humbled me, um, because it will just tell you like, no, you're not going to address the, the concern of the email. You just like, added a lot of stuff like rewriting, which takes half my email away, and I'm like, oh, we did that. <laughs> so definitely being very much uh, open to to that perspective of a uh, tone or how it's landing or actual relevance to the to the chain or to the conversation. Um, yeah, very humbling. So. I use that. Are we moving dangerously close to being lazy? And I think mm. that's what it stops for me, is that it's a choice. Is is there's absolutely the option. You know, I could easily go through all of my emails, especially after a week off, and say, right, draft a response to all of these so I can just go through yes, 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 yes. I haven't. I don't want to. I want to go through them. It's my responsibility, it's my job. I need to make sure that every response with every partner I'm working with has had my sort of attention on. So if I was to draft that, I feel like it would take something a little bit away from how I work, but I'm still going to validate it because I've got the option to. So I think there's absolutely a level of complacency that could come in. I think this is why from an adoption perspective, it's absolutely key to go, well, what's the use case? What, what would you use it for? If it's just to be lazy, then there's no point. But if you're using it to be more effective and more efficient, then that's going to be more obvious. What is the sort of, is it, um, Microsoft's point of view, the default homepage for? Because it's, it's not on SharePoint yet, is it? it doesn't exist like mm. SharePoint. It doesn't exist actually on any of our users' default home pages, but yeah. uh, being content, you have to go to the point of my social 365.com to see the chat, even the icon. Yeah. But the plans to sort of expose them more to Probably. Same so, teams now. I was going to say, yeah, so, so it's in it's teams, teams, teams as, a, yeah. as, a, as, a, as, a, as its own chat. Um, a bit frustrating, it's not in SharePoint. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit strange. <laughs> um, but I imagine it will do at some point. I think the, the, the intention initially was to make sure that every element, almost every application, had a unique experience and a, uh, almost a unique feel to it. Because if you don't use one over the other, um, M365 chat is definitely, uh, especially because the, and I'll touch on this as well very quickly, is, is why they were the new versions of the applications. It's because they were completely rewritten, finally. Um, although there is some features and things we don't like, it means that the integration between the client and the web versions and what you can do through the installation, as soon as it drops that M365 app in there to install all the other apps, that then becomes the focal app for you to then almost have that, that web version of M365 that is that central location that can reference back to your SharePoint to wherever it is. It's now a Windows 11 code by there, isn't it, as of last week? Yeah, so that's, it that's gone live as well. Page, but yeah. Yeah. So depending on exactly that, it depends on where your experience sits. If you log in, the only, the only <laughs> application that opens up for you is GitHub. Well, it's going to be in GitHub if you've got that license, but it's also then going to be as part of your operating system. It's going to be part of your M365. You open up Power BI. It's going to be part of the dashboard. So it very much is, is not tailored on purpose because it's then tailored to the location, the application where you are. So de really, it depends on where you work and how you work. But the idea is that it's there is a co-pilot experience within every experience you have. So we have three types of license, one for OS, one for OS. So buy OS it. is inclusive of, of the OS license, no charge for that. Okay. Um, this is a really good slide that I've not included in here by accident. Um, well, it's everywhere. Um, the GitHub one is already a paid subscription uh, on that side. Um, for sales, 
um, from a dynamics person. Sales and service. Sales and service have just uh, gone live. Additional models, so it's yeah. basically the additional functionality um, aligned to those sales or operational processes, so connecting into contact centers or into those dynamic functions, and um, they're part of those experiences, which is just an addition to the Copal license. Um, and then from a Power Platform perspective, um, which is, uh, if that's charged, We'll come back to you. Can't remember that. Okay, we'll come back to you. Well, we think we can do, yeah, yeah the system. Yeah. Um, and then what I'll quickly go through, because we've touched on this bit, is essentially what it looks like from a, a preparing perspective. So, yeah. Um, so really, this is just for, to make sure that everyone's seen it as to how it will look like. Obviously, this is just a general um, license assignment, but referencing the, you know, as long as you've got a qualifying plan, it will there be ready to be enabled. So there's no additional uh, task you need to do. If it's got an eligible license, it will appear there ready to be assigned as well. But then also from an update perspective, um, making sure that we're on the, the latest versions and it will give you obviously the option then as to how, um, how much channel you want to be on. Obviously we have a development pipeline, we've released different release channels and then whether you want people within your organization to be on the latest versions or one behind or developmental stages, which I'll never recommend because I've broken my home PC enough times. Um, but it gives you the option there to, to have a different flavour depending on where you want Currently to Currently supports the current and monthly channels. Yes, the so latest it's... latest channels, which yeah. you'll see the app just disappear, refresh and come back up. It's basically that fast. Um, but obviously all logged in order to understand the collision you're running as well. But the idea of that is that it will then be, say, on that redesigned application model, <coughs> part of the system then that has all the functionality to be able to be AI integrated, which Outlook five years ago absolutely was not in a framework that could because it was just riding legacy configuration. So with it being completely remade, it means that we can do a lot more with it. And then from an admin control side of things, what you'll be able to then see from Admin Center, uh, obviously as part of your existing um, sort of management and, and governance, is additional options then for what's uh, either required or where you would need to go to check for sensitivity labeling for relevant retention policies, basically what's already configured within your tenancy and how that's then relevant to Copilot. But then also then within customized uh, policies to understand exactly what's going to be allowed, what's not going to be allowed. So this is in regards to um, the latest versions or on which applications you want to have configured there. These are already existing uh, policy options. This isn't new because of Copilot, it's just then tailoring it to dependent on what Copilot experience you want to allow. And then next, we've got the public web content. So if you are a bit adverse to this, you can then obviously remove that option so it doesn't then go out and check it and validate against any incident resources as well. And in the same way of how you could restrict access to non index in certain areas of your SharePoint structure. Um, <coughs> skip that bit because it is on the pages and um, but it just basically goes through that set of process which is and um, there's, a, there's a good wizard that it goes through on the site and um, the adoption page is definitely going to be clinical for all partners on adopting themselves their own organizations but then walking through customers and potential customers on what adoption looks like for them it's got individual use cases as, as Louis and Chris mentioned earlier around particular roles how you would address that at sea level Really, from a from a, a commercial model, how would you get more more seats in the rooms of the house of the customer to get more advocacy, get more trust built in there? So you're matching the challenges with the solutions that you can provide, leveraging AI. AI is not the solution; it's just going to help them get there. And granted, if you have Copilot, you can get Copilot to create a training presentation on Copilot for you. <laughs> but there are training presentations on there that can be taken. We've also done the work as well. So. As to how it works in the different applications. There's a raft. Of, there's so much resource in there that's amazing. And then, and if you are a Beckwith Smart customer on your CSP, you should have the uh, quick training. or be able to, to source the quick training portal that we have, and there's the custom content around. Yeah, there's three so, new courses on there. Three new courses on there right now with that content. So. Another reason to buy CSP through Absolutely amazing. Um, just touching on the dashboard. So this is one we've recently announced, um, and we've already announced two versions of it as well, and one that we're, we're going live with, um, which is uh, just available, um, that you'll have access to alongside activating um, Copart within your organization, and then one coming in a couple of months, which would be a much more tailored Viva Insights version that will have 
uh, more uh, features and essentially more of a premium deal to it. But essentially, the type of information that you'll get from this is definitely around how we've spoken earlier around usability, how much people are adopting to it, how much they're not adopting to it, giving you meaningful, recognizable insights to say, actually, we're seeing a lot of users not do this or do this, or you can then integrate that down to uh, individual um, users or use cases to sort of then look at actually what's happening, how many times have people used summarization, how many people have you know, used it one application over another, and almost validate the actual use of the licenses. So I was referenced earlier a customer who just sort of said, right, Harry, you're not using it, so you're not going to give us any valuable feedback. We're going to give it to, to Susan. Susan's now got the metrics coming in for her use, and we can actually validate to say, okay, you're, you're, having, you're having an impact on your operation because of this. Then gives you a reference based on what we're seeing across your organization uh, in regards to time saved or how much more processing this happens. So definitely leaning on more of that efficiency validation. And um, because if we're seeing your general activity um, increase or come down from a completion time, that's the sort of data you'll start seeing here. So it's much more around you validating how much is happening within your organization and whether that's See, it's reflected as good, bad, or just generally more effective because of the use of Copilot. At least you get the, the information there to reference. Um, and then obviously there's more information then as to what's happening, what we're releasing. Um, there's some really good for, from an M365 Copilot perspective. The community page, um, which they sort of announced at night for everyone to reference that and it's fire. And um, that is probably the number one place to be, even for us internally. That will get information dropped on there sort of day one. And then it will sort of flow through the natural channel. So if you, you register on there and part of that community, you'll get sort of first sight of any any blogs, changes, updates. But then there's also the M365 roadmap page so you can see those actual development uh, pipelines of what's coming as well. So just to finish, absolutely key information for you to have in every AI, Gen AI, co-pilot adoption, technology conversation, anything at all. And from a Microsoft perspective, this message doesn't change and very much won't change and um, because we're still inheriting what we've already got established as part of your tenant agreement. But then as to how that's then processing through the LLMs that we use, that information we're trying to be as clear as possible, as simple as possible, but we commit to that standard. And if that standard ever changes, we have to then you know, go through this whole process again of making sure you're absolutely aware of what we're doing and how. Um, but so the responsible AI is probably going to be the most interesting one to watch because it's the first time as a civilization we've ever had it. So it's very much going to be a, everyone's sort of name is on the line that it's successful, even you know, from a country perspective, from an organization, everyone sort of had to very much take part in making sure that we are in this together. You know, the feedback of how successful this goes or the challenges we've had are shared with countries, are shared with, with other um, vendors, more so from a, are we doing AI the right way? Not going to tell you what everyone's been searching for, but very much just to make sure that we're doing the right thing as an organization with an AI solution. And then just some references to some of the areas that we're, we're uh, advising people to go to, a lot that was spoken about overnight, um, but then obviously looking at um, different sites for reference ability. So we've got our Cloud Transform website, so cloudpartners.transform.microsoft.com, which is where you'll get all of your transformational resources, strategy material, essentially everything you need to build a practice or help someone build a practice. And then the adoption pages, like I said before, that gives you a bit more guidance as to how to adopt or conversations with particular roles, but there's a lot of resources in there as well. And not just for M365 Copilot, but for a lot of modern work resources as well. We'll share those links as well, so you've got them. That's all done. So look, thank you all for spending the time today and investing uh, with us. I think um, hopefully it's been really, really useful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chris. No thank you, Lewis, for, for what I thought was a really wonderful sort of presentation. So, thank you. Thank you.